Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Good evening and welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight, the Thursday night edition of the show. We are so glad to have you here. Our guest tonight, Lester Nare from UAP Caucus, is going to be here talking the science and the stories behind UFOs. What are we missing? That's the big question. What in the heck are we missing? We got all of you as well, which always excites me because we have Tim Mothman and his goatee in the gold medal position. Race fan with a silver and B with a nice bronze medal. Thank you all. Michael Morris, Robert Lamoth, Trucker Andrew, Brown Dwarf. Good to see you all. Stephanie Kenny Blankenship, Princess Lion, Puck Elf. How y'all doing? Mama Susan and Amy Vegas. Oh, I love you, Amy. And Amy will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Major Lee is back. Major Lee will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Para Marv. And from Stockholm, Sweden, wearing Peter Forsberg's old number 21, Lars Janssen. Got to build up the dramatics there. Lars Janssen. There he is. Eternity Eternal, Mama Catherine. Mwah! I love you, my dear. Thank you for the text message this morning and every morning. And every morning and every morning. I love you, my dear. Can't wait. Less than 30 days until I get my big mama Catherine hug. Oh, yes. Right there. It just warms my heart. Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby has arrived, which means we can officially start this show. Belenia, my man. Lee the Bee. Leafy Nebula. How you doing? And who else is here? Let's scroll down, down to Human Carl. Yes, a great veteran of the United States Air Force. Thank you for your service, Human Carl. We love you around here. W. David Page, Little Cam, Aaron Baca. How you doing? Wild Barry, Karen in the Woo Train, and Major Lee stepping up to kick off the Super Chat tonight. The Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you very much, Lee, for kicking things off tonight. We appreciate it. Pam Harris, Bar Madison, Vomit. How you all doing? As we scroll on down, there's Rono Err. Laura Lobbs, and who's next on our list? Digger, Dog, and Ray Finn. Good to see you guys. Christine Lynn, thank you for coming on in. As we continue on with our roll call tonight, T. Tui, nice to see you. High Picks and War Criminal, good to see you. Skip to Malu, good morning to you. Hope you're having a great day. Jerry Carter and River Morris, thank you for coming on in. Philip Bacchanuts, he's nuttier than anything today. Good to see you. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Plant watering citizen. Thank you for coming on in. And Vanessa, good evening to you. Anna Morris, welcome to SOR chat. Thank you for coming on in. Don't forget to hit subscribe and ring that bell because we're like cool people here. Blue Line Bigfoot, thank you for coming on in as we continue on with our roll call. Yes, don't forget to give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It really doesn't matter. I like the thumbs up better because it helps with our algorithms. And those are kind of a good thing to have is good algorithms. Oh, who's on Facebook? Well, I think that's Gary the Dutchman. I'll tell you, if you give him a hug, you can pat him down. He'll even show you his first dollar. That's right. Mike Rivers, how you doing? Chris Teen, how you doing? Nina Williams, thanks for coming on in. Manny Soberanes, 
welcome back to SOR. And I think we are caught up. Oh, there's Cliff Sai and Phil the Stalker. Hold on, guys. Magneticus, how are you? Hello and welcome to the radio and podcast side of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very glad to bring you Lester Nare from UAP Caucus as we are going to get into all sorts of UFO stories and news. And we welcome in Bill WD-40 into the chat room. Bill is currently lubing us up for tonight's show because you always want to go into a show nice and smooth. You don't want that rigidness. Yeah, he's making it all wet. Make sure we go in nicely. Love it, Bill. Thank you. S. Vermette, thank you for coming on in. Hi, Super Crazy. And who else is joining us here? Scrolling on down. Kurt M., good to see you. Don't forget the Super Chat is open, like Major Lee kicking things off. And hit up our Spaced Out Radio store. We do not have ugly swag, people. No ugly swag. You could actually wear our clothing out in public and be proud to wear it. So do me a favor, everybody. Throw those horns up. Let's rock. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talkstream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Navy the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Mumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. It's all UFO all night tonight as we're going to bring Lester Nare in from UAP Caucus to break down the UFO story for us. What are we missing? That's the big question. What is science missing? That's the bigger question. We'll get into those tonight. Then in our number three, oh, it's busy. Steve Stockton has the UFO report. And I make that, the uh, you know, among the missing. I get all excited sometimes. All right. Robin Haynes will be here for the cryptid report. It's Dave 101 night. And right after that, the strange news of the week. All right, let's get right to this. Nestor Nar- Lester Nare. Lester Nare. Let's start that again. See, this is what happens in radio land when you read too fast because you're excited to get to the show. Lester Nare stands at the confluence of technology, real estate innovation, and the enigmatic world of unidentified anomalous phenomena. As the visionary founder of UAP Caucus, Lester has pioneered a platform that melds scientific inquiry with public policy and community engagement, shedding light on one of the most perplexing subjects of our time, Are UFOs and aliens here? Lester Nare, welcome to Spaced Out Radio for the first time, my friend. How are you doing? Dave, thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad to have you here because, you know, one of the things that I love about you is not only are you taking an active approach to trying to figure out the UFO story, not only from a scientific nuts and bolts level, but you're also in part of that younger generation of ufologists that arrived around 2007 with the two, I think that 2017 with the two, the stars Academy and the New York times article where it kind of punched you in the gut saying, Holy cow, I I need to look more into this. How did it get started for you? Yeah, no. So I, I do think we do have a generational thing. You know, obviously the UFO story is decades long and each generation sort of has their catalyst. Um, my original entry point was the, WikiLeaks dumps that included some emails between some of the Joint Chiefs and Podesta and Tom DeLonge around quote unquote disclosure. And at that point, I was like, oh, this is interesting. I had a, I had a mundane sighting about three years before that. So I was already 
well aware of the subject matter, but I didn't really have something to ground me in my everyday. And that really started to have me get a little bit more serious. Obviously, like many after 2017, the, the sort of the question became, okay, if, if not me, then who in terms of trying to really drive forward where I felt like the media was not really following the story and how fantastical it was uh, and trying to fill that gap politically, being a political junkie and sort of a policy wonk, I understood the language of government. So that was an entry point where I felt like I could actually have impact. I got to ask you, when you told your wife that you were getting into the UFO subject, that you wanted to learn more about this and be, literally become a weirdo, like from Ivy League graduate to weirdo in, in a matter of a few short years, <laughs> what, what did she say? I, um, I think, I guess I won the lottery in partner selection because uh, it was never a point of contention. She was always supportive. I think she kind of thinks it's amusing. Um, but it was never really, frankly, I know with a lot of people, it can be a point of tension. I got very lucky that she's just been like, as long as you're out there and being authentic and true to yourself, that's all that matters. So I am very blessed that I have good support at home in the adventure to explore the unknown. Okay. What about mom and dad though? Like they're all proud yeah. of my Okay. My hold on. That's a different story now. That's a different story now. I have uh, African immigrant parents. So as you can imagine, um, you know, there's a, and a, da a dad who's a scientist. I will say it's been, I was surprised. First off, I thought they'd be a little bit hands-offish. Um, my mom surprisingly was not at all uh, unfamiliar with the subject and has her own thoughts about uh, you know, our existence with other intelligences in the universe, which was a huge surprise to me. I think my dad is looking for more of the hard science uh, take, but as we've sort of seen in the recent years, there's actually been a good amount of research papers that have start, started to come out that have allowed me to actually have that conversation with my dad as well. So uh, I, this is not a great advertisement for, I think, what people's normal experience is when they kind of delve into this. I've happened to be relatively lucky um, that those closest to me have been at least not trying to shut me down or put me in a corner and say, uh, do something else. I think that's brilliant. I think that you're lucky. You know, hundred percent, hundred percent. I know so many scientists that I have talked to over the years who do not want to go public about their love of this subject because 100%. of tenure, because of grants, because of university ethics. And yet here you are jumping right into the fray you know, going right at it. I mean, you put all of your time into into your studies and getting your degree and and moving forward with your life. But I mean, you're you've also found a way to to light up your UFO geekness, and I have it too. You know that yeah. you're able to to do that. I mean, I, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful way to experience your life. I think it's also the case that not everybody has the luxury to be able to do so, right? I mean, it takes time, it takes money, right? And you also have to be in a position where you have the luxury of not having other people control your livelihood, where if you do put yourself out there, um, you know, that means you lose your job or whatever it might be. I mean, like you said, it's a lot of the reason why there's a lot of people, particularly in academia, uh, that I've just been able to talk with and, and conversate with that are very much, you know, in the camp of there's something anomalous happening and I think it's interesting, but would never say it in a public forum it, under any circumstance because of the imminent threat of, you know, again, losing their livelihood. So the combination of being an entrepreneur and having my own control over my, my job and my livelihood. And I think another part of this too is, is when you're a minority, the world already judges you without, you know, when you walk in the room. So I have the benefit of having a little bit of a thick skin, I think, from that context. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. You have seen one UFO. You don't consider yourself an experiencer. And thank you for, for defining the difference between being a witness and an experiencer on that. Yep. You love this subject. It, it's something that has, has captivated you much like, you know, people with sports teams and, and their love for their, their hometown team or, or their team of choice, you know, go Edmonton Oilers. <laughs> family cup playoffs coming but nonetheless nonetheless you have fallen in love with this subject and, and trying to to do something and define yourself within 
what could be one of history's greatest moments, whether or not we are alone in the universe. Have you thought about how broad this topic is and the power that it could have for the future of humanity? I mean, I think that's one of the reasons I find it so fascinating. I mean, obviously, you know, both of us have this sort of curiosity that's a core part of our identity and who, who we are. And when you have a subject matter where there is so much of a blue ocean or space to explore and a lack of consensus, um, it's a great playground uh, to kind of poke around and experiment and and really try to dig in. And I think it, it's at the intersection of so many aspects of like our humanity that are interesting. I mean, obviously, where do we come from? Why are we here? Are we alone? These are sort of the key core questions. And the UFO UAP topic, I know UAP kind of is a dirty term, um, has sort of a touch point across all of those. And it's a, it's a science problem. It's a psychological, it's a phys- like a philosophical problem. It's a sociological problem. You know, if we ultimately get to a place where there's consensus that there is a non-human intelligence operating on planet Earth, it's a geopolitical problem. It's a financial problem. Uh, there's sort of the IP, intellectual property rights issue, if there's these reverse engineering programs. I mean, pick your poison. There is so much fertile ground for exploration uh, in the subject, even given its long history uh, and sort of record of information and testimony uh, around it. I, I just find it to be, um, again, a, a fantastic area for curious, for those who are curious, uh, particularly if you have a, an entry point into any of those angles. What do you want to experience? Let's just have some fun here for the first little bit. What do you want to experience? You know, I think for me, I'm more fascinated by how we as a people will react and respond and galvanize um, around like the, the tangible reality of this and then how it impacts us on a daily basis. Like I really coming from a a technology working in tech background, you know, you're always thinking about the future. How do you prepare for the future? How do you prepare for these circumstances and scenarios? So like, I would love to be in a situation where we continue to see, let's call it the modern era of the UFO story that has transpired, at least in the United States, kind of progress to the point where we have to sit down and have the conversation, right? Collectively. Because I think there's a distinction between A lot of folks sometimes want the personal uh, confirmation or experience to say, oh, I had the interaction, I've seen the landing, and now I know. And while that's super interesting, and I, of course, would love that to be something that I get to experience at some point, I'm super interested in then the now what questions, right? Uh, Now what do we do about that? How does that how did we go from being a civilization that believed that the earth was the center of the universe to, you know, understanding the vastness of it and that we were heliocentric and we actually revolved around the sun. I mean, a whole bunch of things came out of that, such as GPS communications and satellites, which wouldn't work if we didn't have a heliocentric way of viewing the universe. The implications obviously of this would be much, much, much greater, not only in degree, but in in impact. So I get fascinated by the, scenario the playing out of the scenarios of what what really happens i think it's easy for us to think about it in the abstract or the individual level but the tangible reality of the collective awakening i i think is fascinating i think it's a fascinating topic too because this is something in a topic that is going to you know move well beyond today's religion today's radicalism today's racism today's uh, you know, issues of of finances or or humanity or oil and gas, whatever it may be, we are on the precipice of taking this planet to an entirely different level. You know, but there are consequences with that that yes. goes along. You know, in your study with UAP caucus, have you looked at that that idealism that this could be a dangerous precedent that actually plays out not over a couple of years we're talking decades maybe a century or two 100 percent um i actually was just listening to a great conversation earlier today because i think there's a lot of parallels between 
the conversation that's happening around AI and this same sort of conversation around UFOs, which is it's either our greatest hope, right, or our greatest enemy. And it's only one of those two things. There is no middle of the road outcome um, because it fundamentally can't be given the scale of, of, again, what we're talking about. I, I think, you know, again, for, for folks who may not necessarily be familiar with the work that we do at UAP Caucus, we launched basically what we're calling a Skunk Works project at the end of last year in the wake of a lot of the more recent government-related, you know, activities such as the David Grush testimony, the Lou Elizondo's coming forward, the UAP Disclosure Act, that was the proposed legislation, that was the first tangible accusation of the legislative branch within the government accusing the executive branch of having these materials. Um, And so a lot of the things that, you know, as we do our work with UAP Caucus, one of our primary objectives is to help inform staffers and members in Congress of the current state of play around the issue, sort of helping them understand the reality of it and the role that they can play in in the subject matter, particularly as it pertains to those who are service members. Um, And when you look at that, you know, one of the things that's a challenge when you talk about the confines of politics and government and Congress is the question of what the hell do we do about it, right? And the implications, um, not all, and the the sort of suggestion that some say of, you know, well, the reason why that the presence of, you know, this non-human intelligence seems to be so ephemeral is because there's not the collective awareness agreement that it exists. But once that happens, does that change the behavior of the NHI in some way, right? That's a huge angle of conversation and consternation uh, in terms of, you know, do we want it to be more widespread and known? And again, what is the time scale that this stuff happens um, is a really interesting question. It's not clear to me that it is necessarily something that is going to be, again, I, I like to say the word consensus versus disclosure, because, you know, if Biden comes out tomorrow and says aliens are real, I you can bet that CNN is going to say something different than Fox, than BBC, than Al Jazeera. And so disclosure to me is less important than consensus, which is, let's say, having some majority percentage of the people agree that it's real, um, regardless of whether the government says that or not. Right. Um, I want to just stop you go, right there for a go, second, because go. I've never looked at it as consensus. I've always called it to our audience the last couple of years. I don't believe we're in a disclosure movement. I believe we're in a, con- a confirmation movement. A confirmation yes. phenomenon. So yes. here you use consensus and actually divide d- what disclosure is from consensus or confirmation. Yes, it puts a smile on my face, man. Because I'm always arguing with people in regards to this. And this, this is part of the reason why I don't go on X very much anymore is right. because of the the battles. But there is a huge difference between consensus, confirmation, yes. and disclosure. Correct. Correct. And, and the, the way I think about the paradigm around this, and again, I, you know, for the audience, I, I really come from a, what work can I do now to move the ball down the field? Like that's, that's kind of how I think about the problem. And there's sort of like three terms that come to mind around this, right? There's, there's disclosure, there's discovery, and then there's consensus confirmation, right? So disclosure in my view is, you know, the U.S. or other global governments revealing information that's in their possession about the presence of non-human intelligence, right? And that is a tactic, but it's not a strategy. Um, Then you have discovery. And discovery is where you have, whether you're talking about people trying to do CE5, folks who are experiencers, or people from sort of the scientific and academia worlds trying to figure out how to do instrumented field studies to detect, characterize, and evaluate this stuff. That's kind of the discovery lane. And I view it as there's a there's a, a, a virtuous cycle between disclosure and discovery where both of those things happen in tandem that are going to lead to the consensus or confirmation. What percentage of disclosure or what percentage of discovery is unclear, but both things can be helpful to getting to the end goal. So I, I know a lot of people are not particularly confident in the government's ability to function generally. So I get a lot of the reticence around dis- reticence around disclosure. Um, but I, I think, again, if you can get incremental inches on the field, we'll take it. So the fact that, for example, we now have on record 
the terminology non-human intelligence, even though it was only in proposed legislation, uh, in again, in sort of the congressional record, I think is valuable towards the goal of confirmation or consensus. So that's kind of just how I try to think about the problem. And I like the way you're breaking it down because I think you're making it, and I mean this as, as a compliment, I think you're making it very simplistic for people to understand. In a subject that I think what happens when you get government people involved, they try to overcomplicate things with acronyms like UAP and NHI and all sorts of different acronyms to, to say it logically, confuse us. Yep. So the way you're, you're the way you're breaking it down for people, I think that's that's commendable because there hasn't been anybody doing that, Lester. There hasn't been anybody taking the bull by the horns with an educational background such as yourself and breaking it down to the common denominator where people from white collar careers to blue collar careers can understand it. This is this is this is one hundred percent right, and it's always kind of a little bit of a delicate dance because I, I'm steeped and very deep in the issue. So, like, I know and understand, particularly for experiencers, how kind of almost traumatic it can be to see how the mainstream conversation is happening around this, which is effectively like trying to either minimize or say that their personal experience is a psychosis or is some kind of mental health issue or what have you. And so like, I recognize and respect, you know, the, again, that we were talking about earlier, the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people that are like, I don't need someone to tell me I already know what I already know. Right. And, and, and that's true. And now I think, okay, how do we get to a place where the knee jerk reaction for those who don't know, right. Uh, can have that respect and understanding the, the, the way I like to talk about it is you have a bleeding edge right? The bleeding edge of the UA, UFO topic. And that's, experiencers are at the bleeding edge, you know, folks who have been doing re researchers for decades, they all know the latest information, exactly what's happening. And they don't need to be convinced that the phenomena is real. But then you have the caboose, which is still where the large majority of people on the planet are, which is maybe they've heard about it. Maybe they've seen some movies, they watched the documentary, they read a book, but they don't, they haven't yet translated the abstract idea into it being a very real and concrete, tangible thing that we have to deal with in our actual reality. So I, my, what I'm trying to do is bring the caboose closer to the bleeding edge, as opposed to trying to lead the bleeding edge closer to the answer of what is the, what is the nature, the origin and intent of the phenomenon and all of its sort of manifestations. Because I think there's a lot of great people doing that. And I think we need more folks trying to create what I call on ramps for other folks to find ways to engage in the subject, whatever angle resonates for them. We've got about one minute to go here before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Lester Nare is our guest from UAP caucus. And I'm telling you, we're having a great conversation. You're going to want to hear this again. If you've missed it, Lester, the idea that you are trying to get people on board from all walks of life to bring them an understanding, you are like a human dictionary when it comes to this, the way you've broken it down, what has been the reaction from people from the way you've broken the UFO subject down on UAP caucus? I think what's been so interesting. So again, for some background for folks who have not necessarily taken a look, you can go check out UAP caucus.com, uh, C A U C U S. Um, and the idea is, you know, there are, a variety of ways people can enter the topic. They can want to, some people want to, you know, hear what the government has to say about it. Some people want to hear what witnesses have to say about it. Some people want to just see the data and the science. And so what we tried to do was create a sort of platform and website that had a look and feel of modern applications. We all use these apps today, Uber, Instacart, yeah, Lester, I'm sorry I'm going to cut you off right there because we do have to go to break here. We're going to continue that thought when we return on Spaced Out Radio, UAP Caucus, Lester Nare. Throw a .com on the end of that. You got his website. We continue on Spaced Out Radio right after this, talking to UFOs.
That was a good start, my man. Good start. Got the call out on time there. I'll be more mindful next time. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. No worries. It's my fault for asking such an in-depth question with one minute. To go. Oh, <laughs> that's bad hosting right there. Hey, River Morris, how you doing? Cosmic Joe, nice to see you. Hi, Nicole Sackage. Nice to have you back. And um, let's see. Dirty Filth looking good tonight. We'll take a... Th oh, we got two thumbs up. Is uh, Science Blob around? <clears throat> Science Blob is downstairs. They just they got snacks before the show, Dave. So she's in snack coma. Gotcha. All right. Hi, Phineas on X and Mac Geek. Good to see you. You having fun yet, Lester? Oh, pleasure. Great time. Great questions, great conversation. I love the way you're threading it. It's great. Community's great. I love the comments. Yeah. Very passionate. They're all right, people. They put their socks on one at a time, except Speed Romans and Shaq Valet. But otherwise, they're good. You know, Phyllis, how are you? Shaq Valet is hilarious. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a good from one. And Shaq from Nor Norway. Anna Morris has her pom poms out. Go, Lester! Give us more, <laughs> Lester! <laughs> Nicole is like, Lester Nari is killing it. First 30 was top notch. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And Nick Gold saying, Great to see you on SOR, Lester. Oh, Nick is the man. Hey, Nick. I love Nick. Nick is fantastic. Nick is another one who's in the trenches with me. We work, we're almost on a weekly call or meet basis right now. He's in a similar headspace that I am. Good for you, Nick. Hey, we, we got to bring Nick on the show here. Uh, he's got to grow some facial hair, though. You know, we, only, <laughs> we only accept people with facial hair around here. Isaac, how you doing? Welcome to the show again. And I also have to say, hi, honey. My wife is my wife is Anna Morris, the one who's given me a lot of love, and she's oh, mad that? I didn't call her out in the in the the live. Oh, so, man. thanks, honey. I love you so much. All right, hold on. I'll I'll make up for that. F you, Zaddy. How are you, buddy? There we go. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Man, th th I'm having a lot of fun tonight, man. Thank you. Yeah, no, 100%. We knew it was going to be a great conversation. Yeah, man. Yeah, totally. If you get a chance, you should stop by Reno next month, May 10th through 12th. May 10th through 12th. Let me make a note on that. May 10th through 12th. Got it. Uh, at the Silver Legacy Casino Resort. And uh, we're having our third annual SOR fan party. Mm -hmm. But there's probably going to be some people there that you would like to meet. Yes, yes. The the I've been going through my networking education. Um, there's a There's a deep deep network of people um, yes. that I still need to make connections with. Yes. Um, yeah. Just be careful of who you're making connections with though. That's uh, look, I, it, yeah. 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 Sovereign farts. How you doing? Rip hard, man. Rip hard. All right. Anybody else coming in here yeah, and stay away from that. Nicole Sackett. She's just danger. Just danger. No, I'm teasing. She's one of my best friends. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, shut up, Dave. <laughs> shut up. Mm. Looking good, dirty. Looking good. We're looks like we're back at Thanks, the bar Dave. again. Uh it's a continuation of the Sasquatch story. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Is that the one you worked on last week? Yes. I forgot my actual drawing at work. I got we had like a million kayaks show up, so it was my mm. brain's mangled. The hell do you need kayaks for in Edmonton? There's like one river. <sighs> we ship them out to BC. Mm. Yeah, we got lots of lakes here. You know, filthy. Within a one-hour drive around my house, there are more than 500 lakes. It's probably good sasquatching out there. 
It's totally good Sasquatching. Uh, by the way, thank you to Dutch Hank and War Criminal and Major Lee for the super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and support. It's a great way to support what we do. And go get your Science Blob t-shirts and more at spacedoutradio.com. We do not have ugly swag people. Go check it on out today. Here we go with the second half hour, everybody. Let's have some fun. Welcome to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind all of you that if you miss portions of this show or others, you can always check out our free archives. We keep them free for all of you. Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. You can check us out on any major podcast network or at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do me the favor hit that subscribe button our website spacedoutradio.com we have a plethora of features for you rock out to bumblefoot read the news wire check out our swag as well follow us on x at spaced out radio instagram at spaced out radio show and on patreon in the space travelers club here we go from uapcaucus.com lester nare is here we are talking UFOs, UAP, and right before the break, we were talking about the importance of this subject and the narratives that are out there and making it easy for people, whether they're educated, whether they're high school diplomas, whether they're in their 70s, 80s, 90s, but maybe saw a UFO in the 1950s that really interested them. Lester, you're really making it easy for a lot of people to understand this topic the way you brought it down. Why did you decide to take this route rather than go hardcore scientific like so many have with the SCU or the Soul Foundation? No, 100%. And, and, and big shout out to all of the entities that are trying to, you know, put scientific rigor to the subject, you know, for the modern era, like the likes of Soul and SCU, like you mentioned. You know, I don't have a, sci- a degree in science. That's not my background. One of the reasons I decided to go with this angle is I've worked at the intersection of uh, technology, software specifically, and digital media for the greater part of 10 years in a variety of different industries. So I have a really strong understanding on how people use devices, how they consume information, how can you take and design a user experience uh, in a way that is going to help people feel like it's Snapchat, like it's TikTok, like it's whatever so that they actually absorb the information. And I think one of the things that was missing before we put out UAPcaucus.com was just a high production value website uh, that's just specifically dedicated to the topic, but that did not make a claim either direction as to what the answer is, but simply laid out the available information in a few different categories for people to be able to draw their own conclusions. So a couple of features we have on there. Newsroom is super basic, some news link. We put some uh, guides in there that sort of describe different aspects of how to think about what do we mean when we say like UFO, like so like what are the actual physical characteristics and how to think about it? What are some of the history points? We also have a community board where people can put up initiatives for things for us to do and build. And a really good one that came out of that was kind of like we were talking about earlier, we don't have good naming conventions, like a shared language for what this stuff is. So about two weeks ago, we released what we called the uh, origin classification system, which is just a list of 96 theories of what the origin of UAP are that span three major categories, physical, psychosocial, and metaphysical. And all of the things that we, you know, we would talk about all the time on Space Out Radio are covered there, where you're talking about cryptids, breakaway civilizations, uh, or even sort of the more esoteric science concepts like that are based in string theory or uh, quantum field theory. So it's a great, like, we're just trying to put thought leadership out there and give a presentation that has the look and feel that people have become accustomed to when they look at other applications. And what we've found is the response, which has been fascinating, is that 
we're getting folks who have not yet been exposed to the issue uh, because the information just wasn't formed in a way that was they were receptive to now being more willing to kind of be like huh that's at least like huh that's interesting so that's been a huge um that's been a huge success even just early on um and building and again i want to just mention this in building on the decades of work from hundreds of researchers who have really done a lot of the groundwork we're just putting the packaging uh to try to transmit that information to more people you are more of a nuts and bolts person, yet you're not afraid to get into the woo side of everything, the experiences and the experiencers themselves. How do you blend it? That seems to be the million dollar question. And I know we asked that in the first half hour a little bit. We didn't really get into it. But how do we blend the two when both sides are so acrimonious towards each other? Acrimony is the name of the game, right? Um, it's either my side or the highway. Um, I think this is kind of why I'm trying to create a, a path to show, you know, that you can be open. To, if we don't know what the answer is, you have to be open minded that the answer could be something outside of your box of what you believe to be conventional. Right. Um, and I don't want to close myself off to the solution because probably part of the reason why we continue to struggle to really get a consensus answer here is that we have. At, at scale as a collective closed ourselves off to some of the more esoteric or metaphysical possible solutions. I think it's fascinating. I mean, I, I think I'm just an open-minded person generally. So um, part of it is probably how I grew up, like as a, per, as an individual and as a person, I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the child of Zimbabwean immigrants, but I grew up here in the U S but I grew up in sort of predominantly white neighborhoods so I've always kind of have had to learn, like I've had always been sort of an outlier or an outsider who's had to figure out how to take a variety of different cultural reference points, societal reference points, and learn to operate within them. So I'm very comfortable with the unknown or very comfortable with being outside of my comfort zone or not around people who I always agree with or whatever you might, might have you. So I find the friction and the tension between uh, the woo and uh, the nuts and bolts really exciting. I, I make I, I make it akin to for any of the science folks out there um, trying to uh, find a unified theory for a sort of quantum and gra like the quant the quantum level world and the macro world and both sides sort of have their strong opinions but clash in the middle. So it's um it's a challenge. I think it really stretches our cap our like the way our minds work in order to put both pieces in the same bucket it really requires you to stretch that brain muscle uh quite a bit um so it, it's a challenge for all of us i think no one has the solution i certainly don't have the solution i think all i'm trying to do is be open to taking in all of the information and trying to do a good job of finding signal in the, in the noise Finding that signal in the noise can be so difficult because you do have staunch scientists out there like Rich Hoffman on this show back last May who actually stated he wished, you know, and he wasn't saying this to be ignorant or, or mean, but he wished that all the experiencers would, would get out of the way. Let the scientific community and the military do their job in trying to solve this mystery. Now, I don't agree with that type of thinking, but that's a personal opinion. I think it's dangerous because you're cutting off a lot of people and a lot of potential evidence towards what is actually happening. And, and I don't think the scientific community actually gives the everyday people who are having experiences enough credit for what they are going through and the knowledge that they have consumed because of these experiences. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a few nut bars out there, Lester. You know, there, there's a few wackadoodles out there uh, who've uh, gone power woo, mega woo, you know, mega all woo. sorts of woo mania. Okay. <laughs> but, but for the most part, most experiencers just have one question. Why me? Yep. hundred percent. No, I think, I think you bring up a great point, which is, um, in my view, so if we think about, if we just take a step back, the one, one of the few constants in human, in humanity's belief that we have it all figured out is that we've always been wrong, 
right? Like if you look at every generation of humanity, it's like, oh, like this is exactly what it is. And then, you know, 50 years later, it's like, oh, actually, no, it's not. So I think we have to remain humble as a species in terms of our current real understanding of what's happening. And there's also this distinction between how we think in the West versus like Eastern cultures. I think jo Dr. Jeffrey Krippal did a great talk at the Seoul Conference that I think touched on this. And I didn't really think about this before, which is because of because I grew up in the West with a more materialistic worldview where the metaphysical and the spiritual is not as deeply integrated into the way we operate. I start with priors, like I start at a base that is making assumptions that aren't necessarily true. They may be, but they're not necessarily true. So I think, you know, a lot of Eastern cultures have these traditions, whether you talk about spirituality or metaphys metaphysical concepts that have lasted uh, generations, right? And they are so persistent. And basically none of those, um, none of those ideas or concepts or frameworks exist in the West, um, really. And we're very science, rigor, materialistic, and ultimately probably there is an intersection of both of these things, right? That That is what gives us to the path forward. I don't think it's an either or, or. I think it's a yes and. I think we need more people being willing to incorporate both aspects because again, Mm -hmm. Even if it, it's purely, if if it's purely a non nuts and bolts kind of phenomena, we still have to deal with the real world every day and the people around us in terms of the implications of that. So we can't always operate in a completely disconnected and abstract way. I'm going to thank I'm going to thank Nicole Sackage for pointing this out because we've been looking into this brand new group that's really starting to take shape called Unhidden. Yes. And it's, yes. And it's supposed to be for the experience. Yes. Okay. As an experiencer myself and as a journalist, I was going through their website earlier this morning because it kind of came up my way. I didn't get a chance to read it all. But this is the kind of thing that experiencers go through. And I'm actually, and this is public. Anybody could go look at this. All right. So they have a list of definitions on their website because they're trying to. It, you know, break it down dictionary wise for people. And please, if you, if you take my advice on this, Lester, yep. don't ever do this. Okay. Okay. So the word is woo. We talk, we've used the word woo here for a mm -hmm. little bit. The definition of woo is anything that's overtly strange and weird. Okay. This is what they put on their website under the term woo. A negative term used to describe more outlandish theories loosely connected to UAPs, such as the paranormal. I, I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. I... <laughs> Look, I'm not, I'm not trying to set you up, okay? You may have friends in there. You may have connections there. But, but the point that I'm saying is that's the insult. Right. That every experiencer goes through because they bring in all these I'm better than you people. Yeah. And then, and then it's it's about kicking the experiencer down. How do you have an experiential site with, while you're putting down, you know, passive aggressively putting down experiencers? I, I I agree. And and this is why I really try to be very careful. And we talked about this in the first segment of always trying to caveat out because again i think with the work that i'm trying to do i have a very direct north star and like an objective goal-oriented path that i'm trying to go down and in some cases that requires the use of language for an audience that is not quite ready for the deeper conversations in order to prepare them for those deeper conversations but that's not meant in a way to minimize and really being conscious of not using language that minimizes um, you know, what experiences are going through. It's okay to say, hey, look, this this forum I'm building over here, it's not the right arena for that conversation yet, but that I don't have to then disparage what folks are saying at the same time. And I think that's a lot of the challenge we've seen in the space, which is the inability to be able to be more narrow in your scope of what you want to talk about without throwing other people under the bus. I think from my perspective, I really love the work 
that um, uh, Kelly Chase and Jay Christopher King do around this, and particularly around support groups and for experiences and experiencers in particular, and sort of not even worrying about the disclosure conversation or the military or scientific rigor. They're like, hey, let's have our own playground where th this is a safe zone where we're not going to have to worry about batting down again the condescension which i totally understand is a huge issue well the problem the problem is the the term woo and thank you to nicole for reminding us it's slang for j allen hynix high strangeness mm. they didn't put oh. that in there interesting ah you know? interesting but the point and look and i apologize if if you feel i put you on the spot for no that. not that, at all not at all that wasn't the, the not at all to do that okay but the point that i'm trying to get at here is it's insultive yeah. it's this i'm better than you attitude because i have a bs or a ba behind my name or a master's or a doctorate behind my name and therefore i'm better than you than someone who has has a problem with being taken or you know was working on a construction uh barge in the middle of the ocean an oil barge in the middle of the ocean and had a black triangle fly over it. they've been weirded out ever since people who have missing time and the funny part about that whole thing too is people on that board know that the phenomenon is all one and here they are trying to segregate the paranormal from ufos i mean cryptids are a part of it near-death experiences are a part of it that's what the phenomena is it's I, everything i i don't i don't mean to plug sell to push my own book here but i mean i will speak to what the work that we do if you if you go to and you know you mentioned folks can go look at that other entity and see how they're putting it out there if you go to uapcaucus.com backslash ocs for origin classification system everything that you just mentioned dave is on there we have near-death experiences on there. We have cryptids on there. We have, and we don't qualify them other than just the textbook definition of what it represents without creating an opinion on whether it is more likely or less likely. And it's, as far as I know, the only resource that incorporates the nuts and bolts and the high strangeness ideas where they're all on the same even playing field. And they're not categorized as this is more likely than the other. Um, so it just just to sort of speak to like how I try to contextualize the point that you're making of how can you integrate woo and nuts and bolts, high strangeness and nuts and bolts without putting one on a pedestal above the other, right? And that's I think the challenge we have is the nuts and bolts people think it's that's primary and all the other stuff is whatever. And then if the high strangeness people also minimize the nuts and bolts. And I think we shouldn't minimize any of it. I just think, again, it's yes and, not either or, in my view. Bingo. I mean, why is that such hard thinking? I really don't know. I, it doesn't make sense. I, actually, no, no. We, I talked to, I was having conversations with someone about this the other day. For a lot of people that haven't had a situation where they have to break down their own, for experiencers, you have a worldview, and then you had an experience that totally broke down your perception of what the sandbox is that you were playing in. So then you become, then anything is possible, right? And there are a lot of people who just haven't had like that ability to be malleable or had something that forced them to realize like the, the, what my conscious experience is on a day to day is just a very slight sliver of not only what my capability is and my mindset, but also like what the possibilities are in general. So, um, it, it, yeah, yeah. I, and I think <laughs> I'm seeing this comment from Nick Gold, which is actually a really good point, which is the smartest UFO uh, researchers realize that it's not useful to throw away inconvenient data. And that's a lot of times what happens when you have these outliers, they get classified as woo or high strangeness and they just get thrown out because they're too outside of the bell curve. But that's actually where, like Dr. Gary Nolan talks about, that's where the most interesting stuff is. Is that as at the edges at, at these outliers? That's where you get the real discovery, the where you really find the new things. So, it, it's 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 complicated. I'm hopeful, and I think what we have been trying to do at UAP Caucus is, again, create a cohesive and inclusive, like arena. We're not totally as 
you know, well tuned to some of the nuances that I think experiences really need from entities, but we're trying to at least not close the door off uh, to that community. It's huge. It's, that's the front lines. They're the ones, you guys are the ones that are the closest to the issue, really, not the scientists, right? But at the end of the day, again, I, it's, a, it's a yes and thing for me. You know what happens from a journalistic point of view when you question them on things like this? They raise their voices. You know what happens when somebody gets defensive and raises their voices is because you've actually talked to them and they don't want to think. They just want to Correct. have their their opinion, and that's the stated fact. The one thing that I have noticed about the UFO world, you could throw in the cryptid and paranormal world in there as well, is we see a lot of opinion as fact, as yes. scientific fact. Yes. How do we get away from that? How do we get back to, to actually wanting to conduct science the right way using facts and evidence rather than opinion? So I think this is actually, I understand your question and I'm going to, I'm going to take a quick step back. Science as a whole, as a general term. And I think when we say science, we sort of mean the scientific method as a way to sort of get towards closer towards some kind of objective truth, right? That's kind of the goal of science. If you look even outside of the UFO topic, science has been having a really hard time globally in the in the sort of the post in, during the pandemic and post pandemic, where there is now a very large anti science movement that is largely related to like the vaccine issue, and so, and I think a part of that is driven by there's a lot of factors, but two that I find interesting is I think the peer review process that exists in science today has become a perverted version of itself. The idea of peer review is if you want to write a research paper and it gets into these lauded journals, you have to have a bunch of your peers, your other scientists in your lane, look at it and validate that the data can be replicated. The problem is there are now gatekeepers in the peer review process who will only allow certain subjects that they feel are in vogue or that they have control over right? Because they want to maintain power. So they can't let these new ideas that destabilize their position of power to get into these ecosystems. So the peer review process is like a key point of issue, because unless that is changed, science is not actually going to where things are most interesting and what it really should be about, which is childlike curiosity. It's in this world where it's just a checkbox of, oh, if you're studying string theory, then we're going to give you money. But if you're studying UFOs, we're not. And then when you ask people what experimental data has string theory ever produced in the last 40, 50, 60 years after $10 billion to spend, and the, the answer is, well, it's really good at making predictions, but we don't have any experimental data. So like, well, again, how can you have that be different than the UFO subject if you, there's no actual tangible data to show that it's a real thing other than the ability for it to make these correlations and predictions to other stuff? All that to say is... is I think the the idea of scientific rigor in its purest form and getting back to you know instrumented field studies and open open source data sets open source data so everyone can get into it is really important but the industry of science does have a little bit of a problem because of how the gatekeepers control the flow of money which then controls what actually gets enough funding to be studied. Science at the end of the day, unfortunately costs money. It, it's really hard to do it at scale for free. Um, if you wanna put observatories all over the globe looking for UAP, UFOs, that's, that's gonna be hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Um, and that has to come from somewhere. So I think one of the things that we, some of the folks that we're talking to are working on is how do you create funding channels specific to this topic that are not limited to the gatekeepers. On that note, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. Hard to believe we're already through one hour tonight with Lester Nari from UAPcaucus.com. If you want a breakdown of what UFOs are all about and the breakdown of the definitions and everything, this is a place to go to. I love it. It's non-biased. It's non-opinionated. It's right down the middle where this subject should be. Spaced Out Radio continues with our two next. This 
is Spaced Out Radio with hopes Dave Scott. I'll be right back. Just two seconds. Yeah, we got about five minutes. We're going to turn over to uh, so, uh, Dirty Filth here. Me. Go <laughs> get him, Dirty. Yeah. What am I getting, Dave? I hope you ordered pizza when I get there. All right. Well, I need total concentration to write these. Let do all this lettering. So I'm just going to finish up the outside. Um, one sec here. The, the old secret, secret tray. No cure. It's okay. I don't need a pizza right now. I I made myself. Bloody hells. Oh, it's all good. I made it here. Super crazy movie geek. Blob is downstairs currently on the back of the couch. I tried. I gave her snacks. And she wouldn't get up. So. This is my fancy border outlining pen. I bought it specifically for this reason, and it's starting to die. Oh, rip. It's all right. I'm going to the art store Saturday, and I'm going to spend a ridiculous amount of money. Some supplies. I have like half a book left for paper. Anyways, I'm going to wait here. I get the the outline done. I had some nice ink that I used to use, but can't find it. It's buried somewhere. That's what I used to use to do the outlines. I've contemplated just making a template. Oh, it's dying on me. Oh, look at that, folks! You get to witness my pen die in real time. Never mind the eclipse. You guys were there when Dirty Field's pen died on him. Bloody hells. Crap. Well. Yep. What a rip. It's dying, everybody. I'm sorry. Filthy is an art supply. Effect. No, I don't worry about it. I got about... Uh, <clears throat> Apparently, this is a research. I got about a million of these things left on order, anyways, as well. Um, what the hell is here? Sorry, doing an art test here, and I should be oh, bonking stuff. Look at that this will suffice. Nobody will even know. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot better. I might have to go over the over the first panel again. That's that's unfortunate. Just try to keep it as uniform as possible. Hi, Lester. How's it going? I'm doing fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm loving, I'm digging the drawing. I wish I could, I wish I was creative in that way. Well, you're creative in your own way. Everybody's creative differently, right? I was not blessed with hand-eye coordination. <laughs> Neither well, was I'm I. Canadian. And I can't, I can't skate on the ice, so I'm probably the worst Canadian in the world. And I don't <laughs> like the Nanaimo bars. How do you oh, not disgusting. like Nanaimo bars? You are horrible. Because, well, at least I say certain words correctly, Dave. 
It's foyer, not foyer. foyer. <laughs> I, I will mention this. I, um, I was actually born in Montreal, so technically I'm a fellow Canadian. You are a Canadian Look citizen, my Try friend. Triforce of Canadians. You are a Canadian citizen. Even the, better. The, I, the trifecta. Uh-huh. That's why we liked you. That's <laughs> why we liked you. Uh, hi, Dizzy F. and Reed. How you doing? And uh, let's see here. Um, Canada Chef Chris, good to see you. Jeff Steve Garvey, he'll hit a home run for you. And uh, let's see, who else do we have here? Uh, Blue Cruise, nice to have you come on in. Hello, everybody listening in on X. Very much appreciate it. There's 71 of you out there. And let's see here. All right. Um, Dirty, I just booked, uh, 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 I just booked May 1st. A uh, big thank you tonight to Dutch Hank, War Criminal, and Major Lee for the super chats. Very much appreciate it. And here we go, everybody, in five seconds. go with our number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. We're talking UFOs tonight with Lester Nare from UAPcaucus.com. I want to say hello to everybody listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. And what do you got for us, Clam? Abdulamania. I'll make that Abulamania. Abulamania is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Now, Lester Nary is here from UAPcaucus.com, breaking down the definitions and what UFOs slash UAP slash NHI slash aliens are all about. Lester, it's been a great conversation so far. We're so Glad you are here tonight. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. And no, the conversation has been fantastic. The chat, everyone's got a lot of excitement and passion. You love to see it. Oh, we love to see it around here. This is our favorite topic when we uh, de delve, uh, delve deep into it. What is the community in ho at a whole missing? In your opinion, if you, you want to be the glue that brings this all together, what are we missing on both sides from the community, which includes the experiencers, the witnesses, and those from the scientific community? What's the glue? I, I think, you know, and I kind of put out a, a tweet thread about some of these thoughts maybe three or four months ago um, on Twitter where um, I refuse to call it X on Twitter where uh, the claim that I made is, you know, there is no strategic vision at all right, as to where we're going, how we're going to get there. And I think that's like a core element, right? If you, if you think about, and again, I think I'm, I'm shaded, my perspective is shaded by being a, a startup entrepreneur, being an early stage tech, where you similarly have to go from quote zero to one, where you have something that people don't understand, they don't have a framework to put it in a box, they don't know how it fits into their life. And then you have to figure out how to get millions of people across the globe to understand it and make it a part of their daily life. And that requires, you know, a clear North star and sort of an organizational framework for what to do to get there. 
So I think a lack of strategic vision is like a key aspect because what that lack of shared collective North Star creates is the ability for the factionalization and all of this acrimony as people recede to their different corners uh, to defend, you know, to defend their side in what is an inward facing conversation as opposed to an outward facing conversation. So the idea is, in my view, it's like we have more alike than we have different, but we're so concerned about the minute differences in our positions that we basically cannibalize each other instead of, again, focusing on how do we increase the number of people in the pool, um, not sort of punch the people who are in the pool with us in the face because uh, they spilled their Mai Tai a little bit or something. Never want to spill that Mai Tai because it usually <laughs> happens when you have like light pants on. And then <laughs> right. you, you never want that. I'm the kind of guy who, you know, will wear a white shirt and get spaghetti sauce on it. That's, <laughs> me. That's me. I'm that guy. I'm that guy. You know what, though? I think you bring up a lot of legitimate points regarding the community and everything. Let's get out of the UFO community for a second because earlier on in the first half hour, you actually brought up a couple of times about the media, the way the media really hasn't grabbed traction on this story. Yes, they've reported on it, but nothing in depth that we kind of need in order for the public to be educated on what we're doing. If you had control of this story, what would you want the media to re be reporting on? This is a great question. Great question. Um, I... I think the first thing I would do would be make it a part of the the daily beat. I think one thing that um, the media struggles with is they're 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 focused on like one slice of the pie, and they're sort of framing that one slice of the pie as the total story. So, as a practical example of what I mean, if if we if we just I'm just focusing on what the media has been looking at right now, which is primarily sort of the whistleblower, the recent whistleblower allegations from the cohort of Will Elizondo, Chris Mellon, David Grush, like that aspect. And there's actually sort of five layers to that conversation. It's, it's not just the allegation that the U.S. government is, is in possession of crafts of non-human origins and possibly bodies. It's also they've been doing a concerted disinformation campaign. It's also that they've been withholding classified information from Congress, they've been misappropriating funds, um, and they're trying to retaliate against whistleblowers. So there are, as just looking at that aspect of the total UFO topic, that story alone has five lanes of inquiry or five lanes of investigation that the only thing the media has done is basically wait for the Department of Defense to say, hey, did you find the alien spacecraft? And when they say, which they're supposed to say, no, we didn't find anything, just kind of like, oh, okay, then there's nothing else to look at. So I think just on that element, I would create an actual spectrum of looking at all of those lanes of inquiry as number one. And then number two, I would actually then incorporate sort of the, again, the, the disclosure discovery paradigm we talked about earlier, which is the um, bringing in and incorporating experiencers and the aspect of that and then trying to have the conversation however you can ground it for the everyday whether that's bringing in sociologists psychologists and trying to work through like helping to put away the idea that these are common other issues that you see in other sort of mental health stuff so we can put that to bed and then unify things so i i, I would do a variety of things i would have a more wide widespread kind of approach to how you cover the disclosure angle and then finding a way to bring the experience or story into the living rooms of the American people and the global, the global peoples in a way that can connect with them. I'm not sure exactly how to do that because I haven't thought about it too much, but I definitely think there's an angle there. So um, I, again, there, there's sort of two sides of the equation. I think both deserve coverage and both require more actual investigative journalism, more nuance, um, and just more airtime to actually build a story. The problem is that we don't have enough uh, actually happening for us to start to stack up and build the story beyond 
what I sort of call the, the, the drive-by journalist, right? So the idea is we need, you're either the wave or you're the surfer, right? And we have a lot of people who are surfing, which means they just come in and ride it, but we don't have enough media entities that are actually creating the wave, the foundational fundamental stuff. We have a couple folks, the like of Ross Coltart, who now has a permanent home at News Nation is the first. And if you look at his numbers on the YouTube channel for News Nation, he has 10 to 20 times the viewership of almost any other subject matter, including the things that are really hot topics and hot button issues in the U.S. in particular. So in any event, that's a little bit of, 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 of what I would do there. In regards to getting the message out, what do you want the mainstream public to know? Is it that aliens and UFOs are real? Is it that we are not alone? What is that message? I, I think you, you have to, again, you have to start, I think you have to build it incrementally, right? So I think it would be hard, like we said earlier, if Biden were to come out and make a statement saying we're not alone and we have demonstrable evidence, um, I don't know that the outcome of like that happening immediately, like let's say tomorrow, is actually going to be a positive uh, because there's no grounding for most people. So then you're going to have to deal with the backlash from religious institutions who really might try to bat it down. And then it becomes a, a realm of religious conflict as opposed to actually having the conversation about it. So I think where I would start would be identifying that the phenomenon is tangible, is real, it's documented, there's data, there's evidence, and we need to do something about it. And that would then open the door to the variety of conversations of who is it, where do they come from, what does it mean, all these other things. But getting consensus that there is an anomalous phenomenon of unknown origin that is being not only experienced by millions of people, but is being verified by data um, is is the starting point. And again, that doesn't mean that we're minimizing what the experiencers' experiences are or that we won't get there, but it's recognizing the reality of getting people whose worldviews are already formulated, they're already established, and this is a fundamental break from their existing reality. That is a major thing. So we have to figure out how do we build people up to be prepared for that reality. Um, and I don't think you start at the end of the story in order to do so. Um, it's, it's not really the sexiest thing to say, but I think that's the reality of living in the real world and trying to contextualize this for people who don't have the same background and understanding that we do. The understanding is easy for us who have been on this side of the ledger for this conversation in the fringe movement of UFOs, trying to make it more mainstream. Who do you look at in this world that's actually making a positive difference towards the public in enlightening them? There, there are a couple, there's, there's so many, and I don't want anyone to feel like I left them out uh, because I could probably go on for days. I think there's quite a few people, um, just ones that I'm, I'm close with in particular, um, that that I, I think are doing good and everyone has their own lanes. Um, again, I come more so from the government and politics and science angle. So these are naturally going to be more in that arena. But uh, I love the work that Chris Sharp does at the Liberation Times. Uh, I think he's really pushing uh, the, the non-human angle as a journalist who has credibility and access in a really strong way. Um, so I love the work that he's doing. Um, Obviously, from the sort of political advocacy side of things, the combination of Mo, who runs Disclosure Diaries, and Nick Gold, I think are all doing great work. Um, there's so many people. I, I, I like that I mentioned Kelly Chase and J. Christopher King. They're on the experiencer angle. They're stepping up their media. They have their new Ontocalypse uh, a documentary series that they're working on. So I think that that's huge. I think they do a, a good job there. All of the... Dr. Kevin Knuth, Dr. Jeffrey Krippal, uh, Dr. Diana Pasoka, Dr. Gary Nolan, obviously like, you know, uh, Dr. Jacques Vallée. I think all of that cohort of the sort of the Invisible College of the Science Co people, fantastic. Um, so their audience is academia, which is still an audience, right? So again, you have the experiencer audience, you have the people who care about government and politics, you have academia scientists. We need sort of tentpole brands in all of these lanes 
to be doing this stuff. Another one I'll just uh, mention is um, uh, Matt Ford over at the Good Trouble Show. I think he does great work. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but um, those are just some of the folks that I'm most close with that I think are uh, standing on the non-human is is the is where this is going and not equivocating um, and standing strong, but doing so in a way that um, I think again resonates and allows it brings people into the tent um, and is not sort of condescending as like oh this is obviously the case what are you doing blah 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 so I love it I love what you're doing here okay moving on I know I've said I love it a lot tonight but I'm just so impressed by you man so impressed with the the attitude and the way you are you are taking this subject and it's just very professional very very professional I, I, I appreciate that. What do you think a UFO is? I, I've, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm sure like with so many of us, we all ebb and flow and, and one day you think it's this one day you think it's that. I think my, 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 my thoughts on this are there is there, there, the consciousness angle is, seems to me to be, core to the issue um and it, it is it is it is so whether you want to say it the interdimensional or extra dimensional aspect i i find the the telepathic communication stuff the 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 materializing dematerializing aspects um there's clearly a tangible physical aspect to this but there's also this consciousness aspect to it that's so interesting so i think i can't remember who who came up with this quote originally but the idea of a a precognitive sentient phenomena seems to me to to be right because there's almost this ability it almost operates in a space which is why i bring up the inter extra dimensional piece it almost operates in a way where it is able to both be in the past present and future right of how we experience like space time and is able to flow in and out of those spaces, you know, instantaneously and without any issue. So I, I'm probably in the um, precognitive sentient phenomenon slash extra interdimensional, which again, they could be physically extraterrestrial in our 4D space time but they have this capability to either transition in between dimensions or come down from a higher dimensional space. Um, so uh, th that's kind of, I think, where my head is right now. Um, I, I, I'm not in the camp that is purely an extraterrestrial phenomenon that has uh, like uh, some, I, I think there's, there's sort of an interesting dimensionality piece to this. Do you think they're from outer space? Do you think they're interdimensional from inner earth, from the oceans, different dimensions, time travelers? I, I think the origin is probably beyond the scope of our dimension, whether that's inter or extra, but I think they, they live, they're everywhere. I think it's like, it's, it's, it's almost like it's in the fabric of the universe, if that makes sense. So like, I'm a proponent of like the oceans. I think the oceans is potentially right whether it's an energy source um or a good hiding place whatever you want to put it um or this idea of the shadow biome that it's like it's it's equipresent with with uh with us but that doesn't i don't think they're like so for example i when i say inter or extra dimensional they could also be extraterrestrial in that they've also populated and are existent on planets all throughout the universe whether it's locally or otherwise as well as being present here so I, I think it's, it's, it's why it's weird these definitions are kind of almost self-limiting by nature because it's almost above and beyond our ability to bucket it into any of these individual definitions. I fully understand that. I can uh, definitely comprehend with what you're talking about. But, you know, people are having extraordinary experiences. And granted, eyewitness testimony is not mo the most perfect. My question to you then is, as somebody looking on the outside, looking into this subject, who is trying to grow it, 
What is evidence? What is proof? This is this is a great question. Um, I would probably defer to I think Dr. Gary Nolan has spoken to this incredibly well before. So I don't know if I'm the most qualified to give um, a true definition here. But um, maybe the way I'll attack this question is what what is needed in order to drive consensus or confirmation, right? Because we can have you know, there's clearly a large corpus of indirect evidence that's existed for decades, and that hasn't been able to drive consensus or confirmation. So what is that missing piece? It is, I mean, obviously, first contact, like first open contact at scale um, would, would clearly be a solution. Um, another angle would be if you had something similar to the Phoenix Lights, um, that would be like another lower level version of it. If you're strictly looking in the realm of science and what would the scientific community need in order to be able to say, we've now been able to have, you know, repeat, repeat, repeatability in the detection, characterization and the valuation of this anomalous stuff. And it clearly has both a non-human origin and is coming from off planet. Um, I think what you're going to need is, you know, multi-million dollar, instrumented field studies uh, where you then have um, chain of custody on the data. Then you have multiple labs being able to confirm and replicate the data that then gets published in one of the major journals and then has a media roadshow. That's like if you just look at the classical way in the science community of how the job gets done, like that's how the job would get done. I think that's not the only path, but that's the practical reality in the scientific community today of like, what is the scope of what's really needed? Um, and the, the, the degree of certainty needs to be extremely high because of what it is alleging, right? What is, what the implications are of that. So, um, I, you know, I, again, I'm trying to break this down into a variety of different arenas of what does evidence mean or look like? which really to me means what is going to drive consensus. And I think it's not simply just scientific rigor. If we all have a mass citing experience, that would be sufficient evidence to drive consensus. So I think it's, it's, it, there are a variety of ways that it could take shape. But if we're just looking at the classic scientific process, uh, we just need huge, huge, huge um, um, investment in instrumented field studies. Um, as, and then on the, on, the, on the other side of that equation, um, and this is where I'm less uh, capable of really contextualizing it, but um, there are a variety of studies now, like, for example, the big DMT studies that are now happening or the studies around these, what used to be these substances that were viewed as having no kind of therapeutic value, but are, and then you're looking at monitoring the psychological impacts. So the, I think there's a whole sort of clinical study angle where you start actually having real study programs with experiencers to try to, again, create some kind of framework and understanding and then language of what those experiences are like. What is inducing them? Can you create and recreate those variables in other people that have happened with experiencers? Um, looking at CE5, how do you create sort of structured studies around that, that process? So I think there's a lot of ground. Uh, for, for what that could look like. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but hopefully some of that makes sense. Well, we got under a minute to go here, and I was going to ask you, I, I thought that was a great answer overall, but I'm curious your opinion. Um, oh, put on the spot. Yeah, no, I don't know that I have a good answer. I don't. I really don't know what that looks like. Um, I can Because I can see a variety. Of, I think for me... Um, it, that's a tough one. I, I don't. I don't know that I have a good. I have. To, there, it's rare that I get stumped. Um, but but I, I don't know that I have a good answer for that one. Maybe after the break, I will. All right, Lester Nare is here tonight on Space Out Radio. We have until the top of the hour, where we are taking a look at all things UFOs. UAPcaucus.com is his website. Check it on out. The UFO talk continues right after this. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back.
listening to Space Out Radio with your host, Dave Scott. All right, we are clear. Amazing. Chat is very active. I, I, there are some inside jokes here that I'm clearly not uh, following. <laughs> Let me guess. Most of them are by Sovereign Cosmic Wildman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he has a flatulence problem. I will make a call out for those listening. I got a note from my wife to make sure I promote uh, promote my – so I, my TikTok is my big channel that I do. Uh, I'm at Lester Nare on everything, X and TikTok. Those are my two bigger channels. I don't really use my Facebook that much, so – um just for the note, and I think I, I see Tim in there popping the Facebook in. That's totally fine, no problem. But my Twitter and TikTok are definitely, and YouTube, it's all at Lester Nare, um, are sort of my big tentpole channels. Right on. Appreciate that, my man. Appreciate that. Thank you. No, this is great. How you feeling? You doing good, Dave? You feeling okay? I'm having, I'm having a blast tonight. Uh, I, I think you come from a, you're, I, I will say this without sounding biased. I think you are, are one of the top academic minds who is actually reading this subject for the people. Right, 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 exactly. And that, this is the thing I always bring up, which is every time I see a lot of the, let's say, in the previous generation of researchers and folks it's still a little bit of an ivory tower. And the question I always have is like, what about the public? Like, where is the public in these conversations? Um, and that's like the number one thing that drives me. It's like, I just want to make sure that the public is well informed enough to understand that people are potentially or likely already have making decisions on their behalf that they should be a part of the conversation for. I, I couldn't have answered that better. I couldn't have answered that better. And, and you know, I get really frustrated at times when I see the insultiveness of, of some people in, the, in this field, whether it's Neil deGrasse Tyson, whether it's people in the UFO community uh, who put down the experiencers, whether it's the I'm better than you crowd or I'm smarter than you crowd. Yep. And I just don't get that sense from you, man. I really I, don't get that sense from you. I, I think I think you're one of the few who's actually doing all of this for the right reasons. I, I think I'm just okay with saying that I don't know. And unfortunately, particularly in academia today, the whole brand is based on I'm the one who knows. Um, and you know, I'm just okay with saying I don't know, but I'm curious and I'm willing to do the work. Uh, but I, it's okay to say you don't know. And I think we've lost a little bit of that generally in society today, right? Everyone's an expert, everyone has the answer. Uh, and people don't leave room for that sort of childlike curiosity of not knowing and discovering, right? Or exploring. And so I think for, for a lot of it's just, I, I miss that just. You know, the Googleification of the world where the answers are all at our fingertips makes us feel like we have all the answers. But I, I still think there's there's room for us to continue to learn more about this wonderful universe around us. Oh, fully. Fully, dude. It's the way it's all about. <coughs> Excuse me. Quackademia. That's funny. <laughs> we got some stand-up comedians in the chat. Oh, yes. Yes. Now, they're a good crowd, though. You know, some of them like Sovereign there. Ate a few lead paint chips as a kid, but that's okay. Crackademia is a good one. I, I like that. I'm going to use that when I push back against Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, so that's a good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, my group really can't stand Neil deGrasse Tyson either. It started with Pluto. Thank you. Joe, for you know what's funny about Neil, which um I you know, I, I guess I didn't really know this. Uh um um and, and thank you, Sovereign. Um I didn't know this, but basically uh he's never actually done a research paper. Like he 
He, yeah. he's not, so who made him an expert in the thing he's never actually done before? It's just unbelievable to me. <laughs> it's unbelievable to a lot of us. It really is. Uh, we got about uh, 35 seconds here. Big thank you to Dutch Hank, War Criminal, Major Lee, and best part of it is all of you are here tonight. And don't forget, you can shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. We do not have ugly swag, people. You can wear our clothing in public and be proud of it and still feel very woeful, you know, while you're watching it and wearing it. All right. We're going to get going here in just a few seconds. And here we go, everybody, in like eight seconds. Second half of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Glad to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hey, did you know all of our archives are free? They're always free on any major podcast network or on youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. The only thing I want in return, just hit that subscribe button or the follow. That's all I need. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Here we go. Once again, we have our good friend Lester Nare from UAPcaucus.com. We're talking UFOs, UAPs, and everything in between. Lester, thank you so much for being here. This has been such an informative chat. This has been great, Dave. You're fantastic. The, the the master of ceremonies to end all master of ceremonies. Yes. And yet there is my one critic out there who continues to call my show UFO excrement. <laughs> I know I made it when I got that title. UFO excrement. You, but, you're not, you haven't made it until the haters start showing up. Well, you've got that right. Speaking of those who are, let's say, anti-UFO. We've seen a lot of them. Neil deGrasse Tyson, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, probably the most influential UFO, non-UFO guy. We've seen it with other people within the community really shooting this down from politicians to other scientists. How do we handle that? How do we go beyond what they are saying or doing with their actions publicly? I think this sort of comes back to, you know, having cohesion across the variety of different factions within the community and going direct to the public, um, you know, foregoing mainstream media, foregoing all these other. I mean, a great note here is if you actually look at the viewership numbers for prime time news broadcasts on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, you're looking at 250,000 to a million of that, right? There are kids in their bedrooms doing meme videos, getting times that level of viewership on a daily basis. So I think one of the benefits we have nowadays is because of the internet, because of social media, because of live streaming spaces, all this stuff, we have the the ability to go into the arena and do the work of galvanizing the public uh, directly and you know, pushing back on the obfuscation that's happening. A, a perfect concrete example is I'm sure many people, you know, who are following the government side of this stuff heard about the All Demand Anomaly Resolution Office's historical review report that came out about a month or two ago that sort of parroted the same claims we've heard forever that there's no evidence of on human intelligence and this and that. And we actually put out a white paper. Uh, a week after it came out on UAPcaucus.com, you can see it right on the homepage, which clearly and blatantly rolls out the contradictions and the poor work that was put into that. And that has now gotten thousands of views and has created these ancillary pockets of conversation and pushback where now multiple people, when I see the error report being referenced, are flooding the comments providing the right narrative 
reframe on it. So I think we have a lot more control, not only as individuals, but as a community. And there are two, I think there are two aspects to this. There is kind of like the top down, which is like doing media, like podcasts or doing content writing. That's sort of has the most sort of spread ability, but some of the most impactful conversations are actually the ones you have one-to-one -one with the people closest around you. And I was actually surprised when I first was talking to people about, you know, the conversations I would have with my friends. I talk to and all my friends about this stuff on a regular basis. And a lot of them at first were kind of like, ah, whatever, whatever. But in order to break down the walls of trust, right, people, are likely to trust a random person on the internet than they are to trust someone who's close to them, whether they're family or friends. So the place we can actually most impact is in our immediate network, where even if they're coming to the equation having a, a huge amount of skepticism or disbelief, you're someone that they really, again, have not only love but trust for, and that will help soften and open them up to the possibility in a way that just hearing it from Dave Grush or some senator or some scientist wouldn't necessarily have that impact. So I, I think we have historically been limited by the control of the narrative, by the national security state as all. Well. But I think the internet has created the ability for us to have an immune response to the BS in a way that allows us to, in real time, push back and actually gain momentum and field position around the subject in the in the zeitgeist and in the public domain, which in my view, and I know it's controversial, I think the, in the post-2017 era, we've actually been able to move the ball down the field because prior to 2017, we never had legislation that defined what non-human meant in a very specific and very accurate way that was clearly pointing at, we know that there is a there there. Uh, that's significant even though it didn't get passed. And that wouldn't have happened if we weren't in this era where we're starting to utilize independent journalism, decentralized media to really push the issue. Yeah, I would say that that it, pushing the issue is something that we need to do, but we do know there is going to be a counterattack from those levels of government and the alphabet agencies who do not want this topic going forward. They want the secrets for themselves. They want the toys for themselves. They're not interested in Lester or Dave being able to fly from Vancouver to New York in under one hour. They're interested in getting to Russia, China, and back in less than an hour. And yes. that's what it's coming to. Yes. Look, it's going to be a fight, right? I think, uh, what's that movie, um, Contact, where the guys like prepare for the battle of a century uh, or something like that when he was in the spaceship? I mean, great quote. And yes, it's going to be a fight. But so is any cultural or political issue that has this level of potential impact. I mean, you can look at any subject matter that's in the current zeitgeist. Race, the LGBTQ stuff, Israel, Hamas, Ukraine, the vaccines. It's all a battle, right? It's, it was never going to be easy. So I, I think that's just the reality of any issue that is going to be par fundamentally paradigm shifting or fundamentally having major impact. But that doesn't mean we can't be up for it. And I think, again, this goes back to coordination, coordination, and trying to find shared ground and shared values across the different cohorts of this audience, which I know is like asking to pull, it's like pulling teeth, but I believe it's possible. And we have to be able to have collective momentum and movement, again, to have that immune response. Um, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to always be that we agree, but there are some fundamental things that I think we can all kind of get behind in order to then, when something happens, it's not 10 or 12, but it's several hundred, several thousand people that are now amplifying somewhat of a unified message. So at the end of the day, like we have to look at our own internally at ourselves and say, how can we better help each other? Right? So for the nuts and bolts people is how can we provide better support to experiencers so that they don't feel left out of the conversation? 
for experiences, it's like, how can we help provide our voice, our energy, our engagement to help what the nuts and bolts people are trying to do and bringing more people into the loop that don't know? We can be helpful to each other. And it's sort of, again, trying to find ways to bridge those differences, um, which are material. I'm not saying they're immaterial or that they're small, but um, at the end of the day, um, it's up to us. It is up to us uh, as a collective, as a community, in both growing and advocating for going in the direction that we want to. That's just going to be about doing the work, right? No one's going to hand this to us. Maybe the NHIs themselves will. That's kind of out of our control. So if they decide that it's time, wonderful. But unless they choose to do so, um, the only thing that's going to change the current reality is doing the work. Doing the work is very difficult where you don't know where to turn for answers because there's so many different paths to go down with this field. How do you find what the right path is if you're on the outside looking in? It's, it's, it's a great question. Um, there, it's, it's really hard to. Um, I think part of the reason that with UAP Caucus, we chose to go the disclosure lane of the disclosure uh, discovery lane was one that was where I was more suited to. I, I know the workings of government well. I have connections and contacts. So that was just where I would operate. But, but it was grounded in a way where I could actually figure out what is the next step? What is the next step? So that is that is the big challenge is figuring out where do you start? Uh, and the challenge is where do you and then where do you start to get to where you want to go? It's It's a very complicated question. And to your point, there are so many angles to this, the, the psychology, the sociology, uh, the physics, the engineering, uh, the, the, uh, the medical, uh, you know, aspect, medical and clinical aspects. Um, the fact that this is a issue, but a lot of times, at least in North America, it's framed as an American issue. Uh, so there's the sort of the internationalization, um, it, it, it's hard. It, it is difficult. I, I can't say that I have, you know, the ultimate answer or that there's a panacea. Um, I do think that what people should do is trust their gut, though. Usually, there is some aspect of this that naturally you gravitate towards, right? So if you're coming from the experiencer side of the equation, and that's where you naturally gravitate, that's where to start, right? So then the question is, okay, is it an internal thing where you want to go through the process yourself? And really go through that self-discovery because for a lot of folks it, there's a lot of work to do there and trying to even wrap your own mind and be able to still live a normal life and not feel so disconnected from you know so from the reality that you're in um so that maybe is where you start so i think your gut will tell you where the starting point is um and then trying to find the signal and the, the noise is a challenge but i think being inclusive being open to collaboration or to working with others or across across the aisle, even though there's not really an aisle here, um, I think is at least a good foundation to help try to go through that discovery process of what is the right starting point. Yeah. And, and I think that's the difficult part for a lot of people is finding what starting point is comfortable for them. I mean, I can see where people who are not educated on this subject would say, look, I, I want to know what the nuts and bolts side of this it's like looking into the cryptid world, Lester, where so many people start off like I did, that this is a flesh and blood creature of Bigfoot walking around the forest. But the more stories you hear, the more evidence you gain, you know, the creature vanishing, looking like Glimmer Man, you know, footprints that are right out in the middle of nowhere. And they, they have no beginning and no end. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it really, really puts the mind to task it really does you know so i could see where you're going but you know if you look at it from a straight governmental standpoint the way they're making it look though is that this is only a military incursion there is nothing happening in the public but it sure as heck happening with the military and the military can't describe it and if they can't describe it how are they going to protect the grand old united states of america i mean they're really really harping on this threat narrative and that's what we're seeing is a lot of narrative in play. I, I totally agree. And um, 
I know this is not the popular opinion, um, and I totally get why. And I've had a ton of conversations about on the government side, like where do you start, right? And okay, like let's say for argument's sake, we go to several staffers, uh, both on the Democratic and Republican side and say, hey, we have 12, and I'm only saying this because the government people, so they're gonna want some kind of reference point. We have 12 highly qualified experiencers that wanna come and explain to you the reality of this phenomenon that we're dealing with, right? They go in, they talk about the high strangest experiences, and then my my question then becomes, what do you want them to do about that with that with that information and about that, right? And I, I think it, the government is not really well positioned to necessarily actually deal with the high, more higher strangeness aspects of this, which is why the public is so important because I don't think they actually have the tools in the toolbox to really address it. So that's like a challenge is like, you know, okay, you bring it to them, they have the information, but then what are the mechanisms of government going to do about that reality? I don't necessarily know. I view disclosure more as how can we get more of these artifacts like the gimbal videos and all this stuff, like the UAPDA that help then us as the public go out to everybody else to drive consensus. Um, because it's it's just it's a difficult it's the 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 reality of a phenomenon that is able to manipulate matter manipulate consciousness and the thoughts of individuals is 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 the most as existential, as existential threat to the idea of sovereign nations right it totally eliminates every aspect of what generations of the concept of sovereignty have been built on. So I just think it, it, it is a really hard issue when you really get down to the final answer of like where this is going. It's a it's really fundamentally destabilizing for the concept of governments as they currently exist because you're effectively saying that there is something that we as who you pay taxes to to defend have no capability of defending you from. And once you reach that point, you sort of have the breakdown in the government system because then what... Are, what good are you if you can't protect me? I'm not saying that's a justification to focus on the threat narrative. I don't necessarily think the threat narrative is exact, exactly the angle either. I just think it's it's all very complex and there's a whole variety of levels of nuance to this. Um, so I, I, not not the ideal answer, but I, I'm just again trying to express how I, I view and think about the problem. I think right now my goal for government is to get to a place where we can start having the conversation about th there is something anomalous happening. And that once we get across that threshold, the threat narrative thing and it's drones and it's Russia and China, it's obviously not Russia and China. I mean, the Langley flyovers that we just had and the way they're trying to explain this as drones and UAS is, is like, it, it is so offensively laughable that I don't even know where to start. Um, so we do have to move us away to it's anomalous as the next point. And that's a lot of the work we're trying to do and trying to get the staffers away from Russia, China drones to it's truly anomalous. And we're going to have to deal with that reality. Is it a reality that the government wants to have? Because I think the biggest staple in all of this, Lester, is that there are a lot of potential lawsuits from decades of cover-up that is, that is keeping the fear of the reality from the public. I think that is the number one reason why capital D disclosure has not and probably will not happen in the context of capital D disclosure. The legal implications, and again, this is getting into the nuance that that is is the reality when we actually say okay when this is now tangible for a wide like for a, a large majority of 51 plus percent of the people um the legal system is not going to be able to maintain the caseload that is going to cascade immediately uh once there is that collective understanding that is i think what among other things one of the big reasons why uh, this has been avoided. But 
at the same time, I want to push back on this idea that the government is a monolith because I think that's actually a really poor way to understand the dynamics that are at play here, right? So not only is the government not a monolith from a political, and I'm coming from the US, I'm strictly speaking about the United States in this context. Um, it's not only not a monolith from a political ideology perspective between the two parties or even within the two parties, the, dis the dispersion of uh, like viewpoints is so wide. It's also not a monolith in the branches. We have three, executive, legislative, and judicial. And there are a lot of people within the executive branch who are experiencers themselves and work for the government. Are we saying that they're the bad guy when they ultimately are directly experiencers themselves and want this out as much as anyone else? I don't, I don't think, so I think it's, we have to be, in all of this, the issue is so complex, no matter what aspect you're talking about. I think we have to be very, very nuanced because each layer of this is interesting. There's actually a political incentive for the legislative to go after the executive on this issue, even if just for the power part of it, not because they want to get to the answer, but because the executive is holding power that they shouldn't and Congress doesn't want that to happen. So it's all complex. I don't want people's eyes glazing over about me getting into the, this political stuff, but but I, 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 these are great to have these conversations to start to try to really break down, I think, how we talk about it and how can we be a little bit more precise. And, and that might help us move into, um, you know, different arenas. Again, I want to make it clear, and we talked about it th this at the beginning, I don't believe in capital D disclosure, and that's not an end goal. I do believe in consensus. That is the end goal. Um, and ultimately, if we get consensus, government is going to be involved in this issue, whether we like it or not. So I would much rather that we at least grease the wheels a little bit so that there are some nodes of, of, of not completely you know what in the bed as this ultimately becomes a reality, whether the government decides to do so or not. So that, that's a key thing. Capital big D disclosure is not an IMO, but consensus is. Um, and I, I, again, I do view the government and them talking about the issue as a way to grow the audience of people in the public paying attention. So it's a means to an end as opposed to being the end. Does, does what I'm trying to say there make sense? Yeah. We got time for one more question with two minutes left. Yes. Do you think then that this goes beyond though, because they, there are many who believe there are puppet masters really pulling the strings on the UFO topic? I'm uh, there. Yes. Right. There clearly is. Um, but, you know, the French Revolution, there were puppet masters during that era, too, and they still fell. All empires fall. I mean, that's one of the only true consistent aspects of us as a species. So if it's coming directly from, you know, the NHIs themselves in terms of the control mechanism, there's nothing we can do about that. But in terms of humans in positions of power that are having a vice grip on this and don't want to let this go, their time will come just like every other empire in the history of mankind. Lester, I want to say a big thank you for coming on Spaced Out Radio for the first time, my friend. Absolutely. This was a, a great conversation. I think you opened the eyes to a lot of people out there. We got to do this again. 100% would love to come back, Dave. Great conversation, great questions. Love the, the, all of the fandom and the comments were great. Can't wait to be back. Do me a favor, if you don't mind. Uh, tell everybody where they can find UAP Caucus. Absolutely. So our main platform, UAPcaucus.com, is definitely something to check out, C-A-U-C-U-S. And then also for me, I'm on all the socials, uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, at Lester Nare, N-A-R-E. Uh, that's where you can see, you know, everything that I'm doing on a daily basis. We're really out here trying to really push the work. So to the extent that you guys can support and amplify if you think the work we're doing is important, we would greatly appreciate it. And Dave, keep, keep pushing, keep on keeping on, my friend. I really appreciate you, my brother. Thank you, my friend. And and uh, hopefully we'll get to see you in Reno at the fan party yes. next month. Uh, I think there'll be some interesting people you want to meet there. 100%. And yes, coming up next on Spaced Out Radio, as we say goodnight to Lester, we have Steve Stockton from Among the Missing. Then can't get a hold of robin but don't worry if she doesn't show up i got something special for you we're gonna break down dave 101 night 
weird news of the week. Busy Hour 3 coming up next on Spaced Out Radio. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with your host, Dave Scott. I don't say this often. I've done probably 2,000 shows at Spaced Out Radio Land. This is a top 25 for sure. Yeah, total top 25, my man. Total top 25. I'll get you to unmute your mic here for a quick second. Really grateful for that, Dave. This was, it was, I had a blast. It, two hours flew by. Thank you so much for, you know, reaching out. Yeah. And this was great. Re- remind Anna that we love her around here. We're big fans of hers. I, I, I will do so. And, and th- she got a real kick out of, you know, your, your shout out. So th- thank you for understanding that. we're all humans and all that stuff. So absolutely. My friend. You take care. Let's stay in touch. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. All right. Lester Nare, everybody. As we say good night to him, what a great young man. What a great young man. We're That's the kind of guy we're lucky to have in the UFO world, people. We need more Lesters out there. We need more Lesters. I'll be right back, and uh, Hour 3 is coming up.
All right, everybody. That was a fun night. Absolute fun night. Big thank you tonight to Dutch Hank, uh, War Criminal, and Major Lee for the super chats. Greatly appreciate the love, everybody. <clears throat> George Jetson, his boy Elroy. Maureen Green, thank you. All right, we have 10 seconds, everybody. <clears throat> And here we go. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. I want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America. Digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Abulomania. Abulomania is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. It is that time of the night where we say hello to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing and another spooky story. <music> Hello, friends. Welcome to Among the Missing YouTube channel on Space Out Radio. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'm about to take you on an unbelievable journey of people just like you. Their stories and encounters will haunt us on Among the Missing. Corey Kelly, a 38-year-old man, disappeared on October 16, 2006, while on a grouse hunting trip in the Beltrami Island State Forest Woods with his friend, Jim Neprude. It was Jim's first time hunting in the area, while Corey had spent much time there during his youth as his uncle had a cabin there. The two friends set up camp in the forest, and Jim went to town to get gas, leaving Corey and his dog behind to gather firewood. The two hunters had planned to meet at a designated point. When he returned to the area, Jim flashed his vehicle's lights and honked the horn to help Corey find his way back in the darkness, but Corey never returned. He pursued some game when I was gone, which isn't unusual for him, Jim said. I had no reason to worry. My dog obeys him, and it was beautiful out. When it started to drizzle, I became more concerned, but by that time, it was late, so there was nowhere to go. Jim solicited the help of two passers-by the following day, and after a brief search, they alerted authorities. On October 25, Jim's dog, Sammy, who had accompanied Corey, was found. This whole thing has been mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausting. I can't even imagine what Corey's family's going through, Jim said. Everybody's coming up with their own ideas of what went wrong, but it shouldn't have happened. That's it. Jim joined the search later, hopeful they would find Corey alive. Despite dozens of searches conducted by 62 agencies and spanning 6,500 hours during late fall and early winter, Corey could not be located in the heavily wooded area. On October 27, a search discovered some of his clothing and other personal items 15 miles east of where he was last seen. They can't believe he got about 14 miles from where the campsite was. He probably got there by the first night. He must have been flying through the trees, the bushes. I can't believe he could have gotten that far, said Corey's mother, Jan Kelly. They're thinking he might have backtracked a little the next day. Sadly, 
On April 27, 2007, helicopters spotted a body north of the Rapid River Walking Trail Bridge off Rapid. and volunteer personnel provided in this search and recovery effort. We've had a lot of people praying for us and helping us through this, Corey's mother said. Thank you to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing for another spooky story. It's always a pleasure to have Steve here nightly, Monday through Friday, to kick off hour number three. If you want more just like that, just head on over to youtube.com forward slash Among the Missing, and we can get right to it. And all we ask is hit subscribe, ring that bell. And it'll be right there, right there for you. Hey, there is a a little bit of a scheduling change here. Robin Haynes is having some technical difficulties, so we're not able to bring her on here. But you know what? We're going to continue with a little bit of UFO talk before the Dave 101 here. And I'm going to, if you're on our YouTube channel, you, you should be able to see this because this is the unhidden, unhidden dot org website all right so we're going to go through this a little bit because the paragraph that nicole sackett shared with me that i shared with lester nare right before uh we got into this was, was kind of uh i don't know just didn't sit well didn't sit well so unhidden if we look at them is a group of people coming together to try and bring a little bit more understanding to ufology. Okay, they break down a number of words here and a number of of definitions from, you know, the Aero program to crash retrievals, crypto terrestrials, exotic materials, experiencer, and extra tempestrials, extraterrestrials, IC, which is the intelligence community, so on and so forth. We get to the bottom where they saw the woo and use the term woo, a negative term used to describe more outlandish theories loosely connected to UAPs such as the paranormal. I disagree with that. And this is my opinion on that. And and it's kind of been bugging me the entire show about this. And I was going to do my Dave 101 on this, but I figured, you know, with Robin not here uh, right now for her cryptid uh, central uh, segment, I figure we could deal with this right now. Because here's the thing. I don't understand why many of these so-called academics are so bothered by the term woo. I don't understand why they call it a negative term. Okay? It's not. It's not a negative term. It doesn't put people down. It doesn't put the phenomena down. It's a simple way to explain what is going on. Okay? It's a simple way to define what we are dealing with. And calling the paranormal woo or the cryptid world woo, even though many of the people even involved with this group, unhidden, seem to be also involved with other projects in investigating the phenomena. It just doesn't make sense. So we got to look into this a little bit. So go to the About Us page. Their board members are John Priestland, who's the chairman, Dr. Vinod Arujuna, and Dr. Rachel Pugh. There's no description of who they are. They have a medical advisory board, which is Dr. Rachel Pugh and Dr. Daniel Stubbings and Dr. Daniel Weaver. It says here, everything that unhidden does that relates to people or patients and their care is approved by our medical advisory board, which is made up of doctors and clinical psychologists. This ensures that our actions and activities are consistent with best medical practices. The Unhidden Ambassadors, Sean Cahill, you may know him. He's been on this show a number of times years ago. Former fighter pilot from the 2004 Nimitz incident, Alex Dietrich. Rear Admiral and oceanographer, Tim Gallaudet. Dr. Beatrice Villarreal. Okay, no real explanations of who they are unless you know them. And their affiliated organizations, UAP Med 
which is a startup group as well, trying to seek medical advice for people who've had experiences. Now, according to Unhidden, okay, their initiatives have been set up to help improve mental health and well-being in the wake of growing awareness that unidentified anomalous phenomena are a real phenomena, as confirmed by the 2021 preliminary report from the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, or the ODNI. One aspect of this is to make it easier for people to have conversations about UAPs with friends and family, with colleagues at work, and if they need to, with their doctor or therapist. Yet stigma and shame prevent this. People are shunned or laughed at if they raise the subject of UAPs, so they learn to keep their thoughts to themselves with all the implications for anxiety, stress, and loneliness that this causes. We want to change that, they say. And by the way, this is from ChatGPT that wrote this. This isn't anything that was personally written. Yeah, they say we want to change that with the confidence that is legitimate to raise the topic. They have a few tips for us of advice, the most important of which is to have a go if our self-limiting beliefs kick in and prevent us from even trying, then we will never make progress. So here's the top five. First, do not go into a conversation about UAPs with the assumption that the other person will be negative and hostile. Otherwise, you may be setting up a self-fulfilling prophecy as your listener registers your lack of confidence from your tone and response accordingly. Thank you for that. Secondly, choose a time and setting conducive to call. Does that even make sense? Setting. Secondly, choose a time and setting conducive to a calm and focused discussion. Avoid having difficult conversations in public places or when you or the person you are talking to are busy or distracted. So in other words, do not talk about this in public. You will be embarrassed. People will laugh at you. You can't make this up. It's right here. Third, choose your in to the conversation carefully. Hey, do you believe in aliens is not necessarily the best approach. Rather, initially bringing up adjacent topics such as flight safety, national security, or the corruption, misappropriation of government funds in black programs with no oversight said to be in the billions or trillions of dollars in America may be a better way. <clears throat> Fourthly, focus on the facts, not speculation, or some of the wilder ideas down the rabbit hole. There is a page on the Unhidden website that lays out evidence that is difficult for even the most hardened skeptic to deny. For example, the U.S. government did produce a report that confirmed that UAPs are real. The United States Navy did confirm that the multiple UAP videos are real. U.S. UAP whistleblower David Grush did testify before U.S. Congress. Fifthly, manage your expectations. If you can raise the topic of UAPs for a couple of minutes and secure some legitimacy to the topic, then that is a notable result. Do not expect the other person to move very far from in their viewpoint or topical interest in one go. Be satisfied that you have created an anchor point that you can return to carefully again in the future. Well, I saw something recently. This is an example. Can we watch a news report or documentary about that thing I raised last week? These are only basic suggestions and how to start a conversation about UAPs is a difficult topic, but a problem shared and all that. And all that. <sighs> These are the professionals writing this through chat GPT that don't want you, the public, 
to be a part of this. If you are an experiencer, learn how to talk about UFOs. If you're not an experiencer, but just have an interest, if you follow these topics, you know, I mean, hmm, I'm going to put it this way. These notes are for people who need a label warning on a coffee cup from McDonald's that says, warning, there is hot coffee inside this cup. These are the scientific community talking down to people in ufology or even outside of ufology, treating them like they are a puppy who is learning how to pee outside rather than on the carpet. And they call us morons, basically, for believing in the woo. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Let's see what else they got. Oh, let's see here. Well, let's go to how to get involved. Unhidden is trying to tackle a problem with global relevance. We are looking for volunteers across the world to spread the word about the importance of good conversations and strong mental health around the NHI topic. We are particularly interested in talking to medical professionals, psychologists, counselors, and others with a professional training in grief, PST therapy, and mental health experience. Doesn't really break down what they need. Media coverage. Let's see. They've been in the debrief GQ magazine in the UK, the guardian. They're brand new. They're not going to have that much, but you can donate to them. You can donate after putting you down as somebody who is an experiencer. You can donate to them. Let's go to the facts. At unhidden.org, we pride ourselves on our, on our advice being measured, appropriate, and based on facts. After that comes reasonable supposition. Everything else is fantasy or fabrication. So basically what we're saying is, if you haven't eyewitnessed anything, but you've heard stories like you hear on Spaced Out Radio, that's all fantasy and fabrication. When it comes to introducing a new person to the UAP topic, it can be helpful to point to key facts that suggest there is substance to the UAP mystery. Here are four stone cold pieces. That's Austin 316 right there, stone cold pieces of evidence that is difficult for even the most hardened skeptic to deny. Number one, there are many UAP cases that cannot be explained by the official Defense Department investigation team. Number two, there are Navy videos of airborne craft carrying out maneuvers at speeds and with changes of direction that are impossible to attribute to human technology. They have been confirmed as genuine by the Pentagon. The All Domain Anomaly Resource Office, or otherwise known as Aero, has shared videos of metallic spheres flying with no visible means of propulsion. David Grush and his evidence given under oath was to be found credible and urgent by the intelligence community's inspector general. Mm -hmm. Now what I want is facts. Teach the boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. The character Thomas Grad grind in Charles Dickens' Hard Times, Book One, Chapter One. So basically, what they are saying is, and I'm going by their words because this is the way they've laid it out. If you're an experiencer, go away. Don't need you. Okay, we're not going to believe you. Your sighting 
what happened to you. Maybe you were abducted. Maybe you were taken without consent. Maybe you were dropped back in bed. Maybe you have missing time after seeing a UFO. You mean nothing to their study. It's only the military and government, damn it, that can make anything credible about this subject. That's it. Now, I hate to sound so negative about this because they have brilliant people involved. They really do. Okay? Alex Dietrich is not an imbecile. She's a brilliant, brilliant ex-pilot. She's a brilliant eyewitness to the Tic Tac incident. She's brilliant at everything she does. Okay? Sean Cahill's a smart dude. Fantastic hair, great beard. Okay? He was on the Nimitz incident as well. Okay? He's also an experiencer. When you look at these people... They are very, very smart. But for some reason, a lot of these people seem to, you know, want to bash people like you, like me, who've had experiences. And basically telling us, shoo, shoo, go away, go away. You know, it's like we're that pesky fly that when you're sitting outside having a barbecue at the picnic table, we're that pesky fly that keeps wanting to land on your potato salad. Get out of the way, people. Get out of the way. We know better. We know best. At least they're not like Enigma Labs, where Enigma Labs tends to, you know, not tell us who is working for them, not tell us who's investigating our case. They won't admit that they have taken a bunch of cases from other UFO collection sites like MUFON, like New Fork and others and called them their own, you know, they're not afraid to hide behind who their owner is or who's funding them. I think there's merit to this project, but I think they've gone about this the wrong way. I would read that and I would say, is this something that I really want to get involved with? Look, I know I'm biased when it comes to protecting the people who've had experiences, but sometimes this just gets pushed way too far, way too far. And for these people who say we're looking for empirical evidence, there's no better start than someone's story. And the way they group everybody in, So they take the people who are fantasizing about their experiences because they're hoping for 10, 15 minutes of fame, and they're combining them with people who have real issues with this subject, okay, who've had real trauma with this subject, even good trauma, bad trauma, whatever it may be. And I'm tired, and many others behind the scenes are tired of being lumped into one bag and saying, you experiencers go over there. Go away. Let us do our job. This is why we keep fighting. This is why we keep telling the stories that we need to tell on this show. Because your stories are important. Your stories and your knowledge of what you experienced helps move the ball forward. Never stop talking, people. Never stop talking. When we do, that's when all hell breaks loose. We got the Dave 101 coming up next. Weird news of the week. Spaced Out Radio's final half hour with me, Dave Scott, comes up right after this. Stay tuned. This is Spaced Out Radio, and your host, Dave Scott. Okay, to my chat room here, okay, if you're on YouTube, even if you're on X, so there's 
133 of you watching on X right now. So thank you very much. Don't forget to hit the follow button on us. I am watching that. I'm totally watching that. Okay. Anyways, am I wrong on my opinion there? Do you think I'm wrong on that opinion? I'm a big man. You you could tell me if I'm wrong. You can tell me if I'm wrong. I I want I literally want to know your opinion. That was a good catch. Thanks, Christine. Beth, you're absolutely right. Not wrong. Cowie, see, I got your name right now. You're not. Chat GPT has been compromised. Taylor says aliens are demons. Maybe, maybe not. But thank you for tuning in, Taylor. Very much appreciate that. Maureen agrees. Renee says, no, mine are not mere stories. They are my San Francisco Bay Area extraterrestrial alien UFO sightings encounters, also family ghost closures. Hi, Jessica Davenport. Fab 22, dead on right, Dave. Thank you. Felipe, you hit the nail on the head. Aloha, Dave. You're not wrong. They sound very condescending and possibly want to obfuscate the issue with Ghibli Goosh. I don't know what Ghibli Goosh is, but I'm assuming it's not good. Dizzy, you are correct. I'm not doing this to get you guys to to try and side with me. I do want to I do want to say that you you're more than welcome to to share your opinion. You know, but this just goes to show that this is the way people feel people who are affected by this community. Junk information. Hi, sweet Tony D. Hope you use two-ply. Asimov, there was a lot of gaslighting in those guidelines. Embedded shame, that's a that's a good comment. And and just to the point, guys, we're not putting down people who are on that team. Okay, because everybody is working hard. I don't want to see any cheap shots to any of them online okay they're allowed their opinion just like we are allowed ours but it just goes to show the disconnect between the community and those involved more on the governmental side Blue Cruise, you're right. That website, Unhidden, is disrespective to the woo and all those affected by it. Rezo Factor, welcome to our chat room. The most important part of UFOs, UAPs, is that they utilize two additional fundamental forces not presently accounted for via standard model of physics. Bingo, my man. Thank you. Great, great point. Thank you. 
A big thank you tonight to Dutch Hank, uh, War Chan, or pardon me, War Criminal, and Major Lee for the super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and support. And don't forget, you can shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. We do not have ugly swag, people. Nothing ugly there. Here we go with the final half hour, everybody. And Dave 101 coming up right now. Here we go with the final half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet, we call Earth. Hey, if you're wanting to know where we can find our free archives, because they're always free, you can find them in any major podcast network or on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on X at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. It is that time of the night where we say, get off my lawn. It's Dave 101. It's time for Dave 101. I'm going to tell you right now, I like being an experiencer, not something that I asked for, not something I ever expected in my life. But now that I'm here 13 years in, I figure what the hell it's a part of me. It's who I am. And I'm not too worried about people who anymore who don't believe my stories. You see, there used to be a day when I would be very, very upset and somewhat defensive about somebody online saying, this guy sounds like a crackpot. This guy th- is just doing this for ratings and clickbait and, and viewership and subscribers. No, never done that once. And if you think I did, well, then really, you are someone who is using a lot of assumption rather than knowledge of learning who I am personally. But I am proud to be an experiencer. I'm proud to be able to share the multitudes of stories that I have for all of you. Okay. Why? Because it's important that we talk about these topics. Whether you've had an encounter with a ghost in your house, whether you've seen a UFO on the ground, whether you've been walking through the woods and little gnomes have been running by or dogman is there dropping a tennis ball for you to play fetch with them. It doesn't matter what the experience is because the one thing that they want us to think is that we're on a Island all to ourselves and not everybody has an experience. Therefore talking about your experiences is too woo and really needs to be swept back under the rug. But let me tell you this. I deal with the public on a daily basis, not just here, but in my other career. And I come out point blank and say, I'm a monster hunter. I have a radio show about monsters. And you know what they do? They tell me their stories. They tell me their stories about doors closing in their houses. They tell me their stories about seeing strange night lights while driving down a logging road filled with logs at four o'clock in the morning when daylight is just coming up above the mountains. They tell me their stories about the little people from the First Nations or the dogmen that used to hunt in their communities before electricity. They tell me the stories about how they found animals 
just dead for no reason. They can't figure out why, but it looked really strange. They tell me about their alien abductions. They tell me about how they go to work, and the next thing they know, everything on their desk has been shifted. And by the way, the cleaners didn't come the night before. There are so many people out there that actually have experiences. We actually see the scientific community downplaying what we are seeing and what people are experiencing. And to me, I think the people involved in this on the scientific side, I think they are actually embarrassed. Yes, embarrassed to have this public conversation. Otherwise, we wouldn't be getting little warnings on how to have a conversation about UFOs. What is the best way to approach it? How do we talk to people about it without their feelings getting hurt and making fun about us? Oh, balls up. Okay? Grab your cojones and actually think about what you are saying. Okay? We aren't teaching a child about the dangers of shoving a crayon up their nose. We aren't teaching a child the dangers of being mean to other children. Damn it, we're talking about UFOs here. If you don't know at this time and stage of your life how to have a conversation with somebody in public, whether it's about what type of tomatoes to buy for a salad, or whether it's about aliens and UFOs, then you better be introverted enough that you do everything by phone and get DoorDash to bring you your groceries, bring you your meals, bring you your magazines, your Coca-Cola, and do everything on your phone. Okay, that's the point that we are getting at right now. I'm proud to be an experiencer. I'm proud to have that conversation as an experiencer. I do realize that many people are not. I was not very happy about trying to keep quiet about this subject because there was a point before Spaced Out Radio where I really didn't feel comfortable in talking to people that I've seen UFOs or I've seen Bigfoot or I've had ghostly encounters. But it never at any time did I need a manual to tell me to how to have this conversation. And trust me, I've been hit in the head many times throughout playing hockey. Okay. That may have, you know, scrambled a few eggs in my head, but talking to people is not one of the things that has been redefining in my life nor should you. I do respect those people who have troubles talking about this. Okay. That's the beautiful part of the internet. When people can have conversations because they're too shy to tell their family, they're too shy to tell their friends or their pastor or their workmates or whomever it may be that they are encountering on a daily basis. And the way that some people make it look, it's like, you know, it's like that old saying, when you're on an airplane and you need a doctor, the vegan stands up and says, I'm a vegan. It's like they're expecting us to say, is there a doctor on this plane? I'm a UFO experiencer. Really? We're not stupid. We are not dumb people. We are people from all walks of life who've had experiences of the most amazing variety. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have scientists, we have bricklayers, we have retail cashiers, we have fast food workers, we have dentists, we have chiropractors, okay? We have accountants, librarians, truck drivers, military personnel, government elected officials, government employees, airline pilots, commercial pilots, private pilots people who like to go boating. There are many walks of life who have had experiences. It doesn't matter whether or not they are participants in the UFO community. What is of importance is those people share their stories. Okay. You don't have to like the stories. 
And the funny part about it is some of the people in the UFO community behind the scenes, they're experiencers as well. They're talking out of both sides of their mouths. Okay, if you don't believe me, ask other researchers. Go search your own names. Say, has this person had an experience? Has that person had an experience? Why are we supposed to buy Jim Semivan's experience? Yes, the same Jim Semivan of the To The Stars Academy. We're supposed to buy his experience. But if Jane or John Doe are on a camping trip in the middle of Montana and they get abducted in the middle of the night and have six hours lost time, we're not supposed to believe that. You see, the one side of the community that doesn't want the UFO people around or the experiencer people around, what they do is they pick and choose who they're going to believe. And they have a few chosen ones. And the names I'm going to drop are not insultive to these people because I really like these people. Whether it's J. Christopher King, whether it's Chris Bledsoe, and many others that we don't even know. But if you are some of the chosen ones, your stories are okay. How does that make sense? Fact is, it doesn't. We have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in North America alone who just want to know why this is happening to them. Why did they get chased out of a forest by a Sasquatch? Why is their home haunted? And yet when they move, the hauntings continue. What about people who, in the middle of the night, are getting abducted? Or even worse, people, even worse, waking up and having their children say, I had a bad dream last night, Mommy or Daddy. And I felt like somebody took me away. And the next thing I saw was stars. No, that's not from personal experience, but it has happened. I've heard the stories. There's something very pompous about the scientific community, but the sad part about it is the, as experiencers, we need them. We need them, but we need more Lester Nares than we do Enigma Labs or places of such ilk that they think that they are better than us by putting us down. You know, it's funny because Tom DeLonge in the To The Stars Academy did this to the public. And I remember having a conversation with Lou Elizondo about this. Okay, and that conversation was that Lou told me one of the biggest mistakes the TTSA made was the fact that they excluded the UFO community. Their biggest support group, they've cut it off. But it doesn't seem like any of these other groups, okay, have learned the lesson of the TTSA. And look, this it doesn't matter whether you like Lou Elizondo or not. That's a pretty profound comment. And I feel, and I'm sure you may too do as well, and if you don't, that's okay. You're allowed your opinion, and I'd like to hear your opinion, which you could put a comment on our YouTube channel or message me on Facebook or email or whatever it may be. I want to hear your opinion. But as experiencers, we're tired of getting lambasted. We're tired of being treated like we are the garbage of the weird communities, whether it's Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens, paranormal. The true experiencer just wants to know why them. Why does this keep happening? The true experiencer is scared. The true experiencer wants to lean on people in their own community where they don't feel shamed. But we could still have the conversation. And trust me, those experiencers are trying. They do need people who need to open up their ears a little bit more but there's still a community that can reach out to them and they can reach out to as well. And I'm saying all this because this is a big week for myself. Okay. Yesterday was the 10 year anniversary of me witnessing a UFO landing in a few days. It's going to be the 10 year anniversary of meeting one of the most important people in my life in Samantha Mowat. And then 25 minutes after meeting her, 
walking into a forest to seeing a 10 to 12 foot extraterrestrial. But according to certain groups, it never happened. It's just wild fantasy and conjecture. It's funny how they can have an opinion from a scientific method that is supposed to mean something. But my story and my truth to myself doesn't matter. So before we end this, Dave 101, I want to remind all of you that your stories do matter. Your encounters matter. The way it's affected you physically, emotionally, mentally matters. What doesn't matter is the opinions of those who are trying to shut us up. And that is your Dave 101. What time is it? It's time for Shirky Poo's News. All right, let's make things happen here on the Weird News of the Week. Here's one for you. A former Howard Stern show writer and YouTube personality has a lot to answer for after a video of her hitting her boyfriend went viral. Elisa Ann Schwartz, who goes by Elisa Jordana, posted a live stream to YouTube on Monday as she drove through Palm Beach County with her boyfriend beside her when a violent argument broke out between the couple. Schwartz wound up repeatedly punching and threatening the man who has yet to be named while confronting him about an alleged affair. In retaliation, the man grabbed her head and chases after her on the road before returning to the car and turning off the live stream. Just hours after the clip went on YouTube, Schwartz was arrested by Palm Beach's sheriff's office and charged with felony battery. I just want to say I'm so sorry for what I portrayed on my live stream that everybody saw, Schwartz said in a statement to the Daily Mail. This is not what I want to give to the world that it sucks that I got into such sadness and anger. It really, it was really a negative representation of who I am. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. This is what you were hiding from the world. I'm just going to throw my own little piece of notes in there. This is what you were hiding from the world. This is just to save your subscribers right now. She goes, I'm going to do everything I can to have better relationships with people that are good to me and people that I'm also good for. The two hour plus live stream, which was posted with the title, Not Doing Good, has garnered more than 150,000 views on YouTube as of Wednesday. Schwartz spent nearly six years working for the Howard Stern Show as a writer and even appeared occasionally on the show. And this is where I'm going to give the disclaimer, okay? If you are someone who is being abused by someone, please seek help. Please seek help. You are you have value. And nobody, whether you're male, female, non-binary, I don't care, Okay, nobody deserves to be hit. Nobody deserves to have any sort of violence brought against them. Report it. Call the police. Go get help from a counselor. Okay, don't put it on social media. Don't. This is somebody who it's the typical influencer thing where they are portraying one side in front of the camera when there's somebody different on the other side. And this got out of hand. It's ugly. Mexican comic influencer Yared Lacona has to have three quarters of her, or had to have, oh my goodness, hold on, this poor girl, she had to have three quarters of her buttocks amputated, yeah, you heard that right, three quarters of her buttocks amputated at a hospital in Mexico City after filler injected into her behind leaked, oh my, how does that even happen? Yared said that she was visiting her daughter when she realized things were a little off behind her. She goes, I was flying to Canada and started feeling something was wrong on the plane. It started to hurt and I went to the bathroom and I felt my bum and it was really hard. I thought to myself, what's going on? Doctors later discovered polymers 
injected into Yerid's backside during a cosmetic procedure had leaked and caused her to suffer from a rare condition known as Asia syndrome, which stands for autoimmune inflammatory syndrome induced by adjuvants. I don't know what an adjuvant is, but it doesn't sound good. Yerid said that she's unable to pinpoint who is responsible because she's unsure of which stage the silicone was injected into her butt during a number of cosmetic procedures. They amputated the upper part. Uh, what did they put here? Hold on. I lost my, my train here. So excited by this story. Uh, yeah. They amputated just the upper part, which was around four fingers width from both buttocks. That's why I'm devastated. It was an amputation. It was a piece of flesh that was taken from me. But I can't point to someone as responsible because I don't know, because at no stage did anyone say to me, we're going to inject this into your body. Imagine my surprise when this happened. You know what? Maybe maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me, but maybe you shouldn't have done that. In Montreal, Deborah de Bracalier knew she would have to face her fear of bugs when she volunteered to be marooned on a remote island in the Philippines, but perhaps her greatest challenge awaited her when she returned home to Quebec. You see, the 39-year-old elementary school teacher is one of 20 cast members on the second season of Survivor Quebec, a French-language franchise of the popular reality show competing in a series of thrill-seekers braving physical challenges and grueling environmental conditions to win up to about 100 grand. As of the latest episode, this past Wednesday, De Bracalier was one of the 16 remaining contestants. Yet while viewers watch her vie in favor of her fellow competitors to avoid elimination by group vote, different kind of drama is unfolding in, say, Hyacinth, Quebec. Yeah, why? Well, the governing council of the school district where she teaches had taught grade three voted 7-5 and five in favor of firing her for taking unauthorized time off to participate in a television show. Wow. Unbelievable. Hello, Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal. Rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Facebook, Spreaker, LinkedIn, the Space Travelers Club, and on X, hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, make a mistake. We're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has gone for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. The sheets are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. That's a good show, people. Good show. All right. Turn that thing off. Okay, what do you guys want to talk about while I'm doing a little bit of editing? You like the Dave 101? Chew me a new one if you need. I'm okay with that. All right. 
right, move that over. Rezo, is this your first time here? Oh, we're glad you're here, man. Welcome. We're here every night of the week, man. Every night of the week. Um, yes, you can, Maureen. Yes, you can. <coughs> uh, I can't guarantee a swag bag at that point, but yes, you can. So for people who are wondering what I'm doing now, you know, I am editing the radio show, cutting it up into segments for our radio stations. Then I send it off via MP3. And yeah, so you guys get to hang out. If you have any questions, just put them in capital letters in the YouTube chat room. It's easier for me to see while I'm uh, working on everything, guys. What we call CTP size. Right. Rezo Factor, where are you from? Robert Anthony, great show. Yes, I hope so too, Robert. I missed going down there this year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Logan. Uh, tomorrow is Dr. Frederick Woodard talking about uh, developing your supernatural abilities. Frederick's a good guy. We've had him on once before. Your host, Dave Scott. When people or companies like P Med make the claim that the government has acknowledged that UAPs and UFOs are real, do you find it disingenuous and therefore find the people saying it's suspect? Um, 
No, because I think they're pointing out basic truth that uh, that has come out. I don't see that as a red flag. What I see as the red flag is that the people are out there kind of denying it, you know, that it's actually real. I mean, we've always wanted the Pentagon to admit that UFOs are real. When they finally do, we're like, yeah, bullshit, right? I mean, we can it's funny the, we're a group that wants its cake and eat it too. But the minute the cake comes to eat it, we refuse to eat it because we say we're on a diet. You know, it's funny. I was just thinking there for a quick second. Sometimes I tune out when I'm thinking, which I was just doing there. Okay. Let's take let's take the woo word again. How it's insultive to the community, to many people in the community to use the word woo to describe everything. All right. However, what about those of us who hate the term UAP or hate the term squatch? Where's our voice in that? Why aren't we allowed to be public and, and shame people for using terminology that is unprofessional? Think about that for a second. I'm a UFO guy. I really am. I'm a UFO guy through and through. And I have steadfastly said for the last couple of years, that UAP is a cover-up for man-made objects. UFOs, we're still searching for. Right. But I know there are people involved in those groups that absolutely hate the word woo because they've told me. I find UAP offensive. So because I don't have a BA, a BS, or a master's behind me, I'm supposed to fall in line with their made-up acronyms because it sounds better. It's more inclusive. Right? I didn't see that uh, you're, you're, the, the lady you would like to date majorly is now having ancient Egyptian memories. I know you got a big crush there. It's almost to the point, though, where you just, you know, and I'm almost at that point now where I just... Like, I don't care what people's opinions are of me anymore. I'm doing this show for me and what I believe is right for our public.
Just annoying. Totally, totally annoying. Tets, how you doing? On that note, guys, big thank you and big love for all of you coming out tonight. Thank you to our new subscribers. If you're new here and haven't hit subscribe yet, hopefully we did enough to earn that. Thank you to Dutch Hank, War Criminal, and Major Lee for the super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and support. Tomorrow night on the show, we are going to be joined by Dr. Frederick Woodard, developing your supernatural abilities. Should be a lot of fun. I hope you come in to join us and uh, hang out with us as well. We'll see you tomorrow night, everybody, and have a great night. healthy my friend you too you need bail money give me a call always dad take care <laughs> you too